That's right, everybody. As always, thank you so much for tuning in and making this your podcast or your live stream of choice. I'm your host, John Greenwald Jr., founder and creator of theblackvault.com, and I am doing this live show. I didn't uh, really think it was going to get along the way. Every time I do these things, something drastic happens, uh, and of course, uh, that happened uh, on this one as well. But I think everything has worked out with the phone systems. We're going to open up those phone lines in just a little bit, uh, and that is something that I'm uh, pretty excited about. So before we get there, though, I want to go through a couple of the up Dates that the Black Vault has posted. Uh, it's been about a month uh, since we have done a show like this and where I get to update you guys and, you know, tell you a little bit about what's going on on the website and what kind of documents and so on and so forth. So uh, as people roll in here, I'm broadcasting these live shows now throughout the social media platforms that the Black Vault reaches. So primarily is YouTube. If you're not watching on YouTube, that really is where most of the action happens. In fact, about 98, 99% of the action. So if you're on Facebook or Twitter's Periscope, I think they call it now, uh, or I, I thought they didn't call it that anymore, but I guess they still do. I don't know. I can't keep all of that straight, but regardless, it's blasting on all of those. YouTube's chat is pretty much going to be the, 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 the most hopping. So if you don't know how to get there, go to the blackvault.com slash live and that will bounce you to the YouTube channel. I've got access though to everybody on all the platforms. So I will be able to see uh, at least to the best of my ability anyway, all of those comments streaming through. But there's already a couple hundred people watching. Uh, we're just getting underway. So my guess is if history is going to repeat itself, there's no way I'm going to be able to watch that chat as we go. I will do my best. Those on YouTube super chats are open. Uh, those are a great way to support the channel 100% of anything that comes in on a super chat goes right back into supporting this channel. Uh, interviews, live streams, stuff like that. So thank you for that uh, if you decide to do it. And those actually help stick out a little bit more in my eye here on this monitor when they come in. So uh, with that, let me go ahead and start with some of the let's call them updates here in, in, the last, uh, in the last month or so since we've talked last. Now, first, uh, on a personal note, uh, I forgot to, to mention this already. If I stop for a second or seemingly wince in pain, uh, I didn't want to admit this, but I'm gonna have to. I did something to my back yesterday. Uh, I believe I was playing with my son and it is excruciating. So that was one of the reasons why I didn't think this show would go off uh, tonight, but I really, really wanted to do it. And this is going to kind of help keep my mind off of that. So if I do kind of stop for a second and maybe you'll see me shift, uh, that's why it is uh, absolutely awful, uh, to be honest with you. But uh, I, I usually don't get personal, uh, especially about ailments, but you guys might be able to pick up on it if you know me and have seen this channel before. So that uh, was the quick explanation. So let's get rolling here. Here's here's some of the updates. Uh, this I want to start with. This is one of the most recent that I published this week. This was not available anywhere else. Uh, I had done a FOIA request to NASA, got quite a few different documents and discovered that Bill Nelson, the administrator for NASA, uh, is uh, or excuse me, was uh, going to be briefed on UAPs this week, specifically the 17th. Now, I published this story and uh, to be honest with you, gave the Department of Defense and NASA about a week to respond. And of course, they didn't. I published the story with the documents saying that Administrator Nelson was set on the 17th to be briefed and uh, wanted to see if they would comment. They did not. I published on Monday because his briefing was scheduled for Tuesday. And lo and behold, a couple hours after I published, I had a full comment and statement from the DOD. These were the documents that I got, just so you guys know how some of these stories unfold. Uh, when I start fishing around via the Freedom of Information Act, and some of you guys who, who are um, either getting into it, I know a lot of people that use the FOIA uh, or are thinking about using the FOIA uh, like to hear these little extra tidbits. What you try and do is you find literally the little 
nugget of gold in the stack of documents that comes in. Sometimes it is excruciatingly boring, meaning you will get a thousand pages on something and there's just like nothing there. Uh, that was kind of true with this NASA dump uh, that they gave me. And there were quite a few different pages that came in responsive to my request. There were different emails and, and different documents and stuff like that uh, that came up with unidentified aerial phenomena as a keyword or different variations, UAP. And you'll see on this side here uh, in this breakdown of a OIIR weekly update. And uh, essentially what, what this is, is is a schedule of events. Uh, it's sent out every week. Uh, this particular data dump that I got from NASA, there were a couple in there. And on August 17th, you will see it says briefing to administrator on task force report on unidentified aerial phenomena. This was not known before. This was not something that uh, was around, had been reported by mainstream media. Out of everything that I got, that one line was the only interesting piece of this. And so that's where I went ahead and, and just glommed on to that, uh, sent press requests uh, for comment to NASA, but also the DOD. Anything that they do on UFOs or UAPs goes right to Susan Goff. Uh, it's no secret. So CC'd her on the same email, but was hoping that NASA's uh, uh, PR person for the administrator uh, who I've spoken with before. I was hoping she might be able to give me something. She was not on behalf of the DOD came a couple hours after I published the story announcing it. In short, it was confirmed. So on Tuesday, uh, Nelson, although they did not confirm uh, through the press office that he was there, the documentation does that for us, that the briefing was for the NASA administrator. So it seems like here, here's the point of, of these types of stories, because that doesn't sound like all that big of a deal. What this shows is things are working, things are progressing. It seems like with the mainstream media after that UAP report came out, it seems like everything kind of really like took the wind out of the sails of the mainstream media covering this. That's the feeling that I got. It's because that report was not mind blowing. Um, and, and I think the mainstream media was was hoping that it would be. But these types of stories, albeit small and are not, you know, mind blowing in itself, what they show is things are working. Uh, agencies are getting involved at the top layer and NASA being involved in this. I, I published a story about a month ago. This one was from this week, uh, but quite a few weeks ago that showed that the UAP task force had reached out to NASA and said, hey, we want to request a briefing with you guys on UAPs, at, which did unfold. I was able to confirm that as well. But this shows that things are progressing. The UAP task force is working. The UAP topic is important. Uh, this is obviously going to the NASA administrator and not some you know, low level guy. Uh, this is the top. And so this shows that it really is progressing. So I dig stories like that. Again, nothing on its own that's completely mind blowing but rather just another piece of the puzzle showing that we are getting somewhere, that we're going somewhere. Another story that uh, I went ahead and, and, and uh, published here in the last couple of weeks was on the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence passing uh, in their committee, the Intelligence Authorization Act for fiscal year 2022. Now, just a refresher, 2021's same act, which then ended up in the COVID relief package. And it's a very convoluted, confusing story. But regardless, the language that that essentially mandated that report on UAPs that was published uh, in June, that was from the Intelligence Authorization Act. For 2022, now that's starting to come to fruition and starting to go through the process. That in itself is also progressing to the point where they also have UAP task force information in there, but also something was very interesting. Not only will there be periodic updates uh, and, and at, at this stage of the game anyway, that's what they're aiming for. There will be those updates and the reports, but also this line, availability of data on unidentified aerial phenomena. The Director of National Intelligence and the Secretary of Defense shall each in coordination with each other require each element of the intelligence community and the Department of Defense with data relating to unidentified aerial phenomena to make such data available immediately to the Unidentified Aerial Phenomena Task Force and to the National Air and Space Intelligence Center. 
what does that mean? It means that the Air Force is entering the game. The National Air and Space Intelligence Center is essentially uh, showing that the UAP task force is working with that one military branch that is completely mum and has been mum on this topic for the most part. And they are heavily involved. On this channel, I've done a video about the fact that the UAP task force report, or what's often referred to as the UAP task force report, was co-authored by a Air Force Major General. And so even though we're not hearing from them, you see stuff like this and realize the Air Force is very much involved, but they're just not publicly involved. What level of their involvement is kind of anybody's guess. I've, I've still got numerous open cases and trying to dig on that, and that'll play into my next story in a moment. But exactly what kind of role they're playing is a little bit of a mystery. So that is still unfolding. But for me anyway, that was the difference about the language in this bill and the National Air and Space Intelligence Center within the United States Air Force. Like I said, it plays into a little bit of my next story as well that I published. I received more internal communications from the United States Air Force on UAPs and UFOs, some of which had never been published before. What's interesting about this is you see and you can juxtapose the difference between internal communications from the United States Air Force and let's say the United States Navy. And it's very interesting because they are drastically different in the way they view and handle the UAP topic and information, especially through the Office of Public Affairs or the, or, you know, AKA the press office. And you can see how the Navy has been in the past couple of years, very open about not understanding the phenomena, how it's unidentified, how it's things that they can't, they can't understand, they can't figure out. The Air Force's press office internally showed that they said they were talking about drones and UASs and the media turns it into UFOs and aliens. And so those are two wildly different viewpoints from two different branches of our United States military. So it'll be very interesting as this all unfolds to see how the United States Air Force essentially plays ball with the Navy's uh, UAP task force, which is headed by the you know uh, Office of Naval Intelligence, I, I guess is where it's technically at. Again, a lot of those details, albeit are rumored about right now, are not solidified um, in stone yet because a lot of it has not come out. But definitely don't miss those documents because there's a lot of, of interesting, interesting material uh, in that. Now, I did uh, tease this out, so to speak. You know, I always harp on people for teasing, but I figured a 40 minute heads up on what I was going to be talking about uh, in this particular segment was okay. Uh, apologies if anybody hates teases like that. Uh, but uh, I wanted to at least tell you guys that there was something new to this stream. It's not just an overview. The. Uh, story that I'm working on right now, just to give you guys a little bit of a sneak peek, uh, is all about the To The Stars Academy of Arts and Science, that's Tom DeLonge's group, and the agreement that he made with the United States Army. Now, just a quick refresher for those, because it's been a while since we've really heard about this. Uh, this goes back to October of 2019. This was the story that I had published back then, uh, I was one of the very first to get the actual agreement. Now, To The Stars Academy released a press release, said that they had created this agreement with the United States Army and that they were going to be utilizing essentially Army facilities and equipment to analyze the UAP debris or pieces or however you want to refer to them within the United States Army. Now, regardless of what your thoughts are on this, I was immediately kind of taken aback by that announcement. Not necessarily that they made an agreement with the military, but the fact, like my biggest concern was the fact that here they are collecting all of this UAP related material. And we've all talked about, and we're all pretty much in agreement. There is a cover up of some kind by the United States military and by the, the United States government. You're taking all this UAP material and walking it back into the doors of the United States military for testing. Now, 
on the surface, it seemed great. Uh, but as you dig, it was very concerning that that there was something, you know, going on here. Like, why would you why would you do that? And although my critique is more about the claims they made that that has connected to the military, to the DOD, to ATIP, to UFOs and so on, I kind of left for the most part TTSA alone. But when this happened, that was when I, I just had to say something that this was that this was just a little bit bizarre. So the question mark is what has happened? And since 2019, October, uh, to be exact, I have followed the story, I've hit up the uh, US Army Combat Capabilities Development Command, or the Ground Vehicle Systems Center, the GVSC uh, is the acronym and ask them what is going on like taxpayer money is going towards this. So at what level do we get to know as taxpayers in the general public what is going on. And for quite a long time, there's no update, no update. I'm sorry, there's no movement, then COVID happened. No, nothing, you know, with COVID and so on and so forth. So I kept I kept at it kept filing requests, so on and so forth. And finally, uh, got some documents. Now you can see here, this was an internal document for the media and public affairs activity, uh, very similar to NASA that the, they send out these weekly internal uh, updates and so on. And this was in part of the data batch that I'm that I'm going to publish next week. Um, I, I'm not hiding anything from you guys. It's just would be way too long to go over everything. So I'll publish everything next week. Uh, but just to kind of give you guys an idea, this was the internal communication. Uh, it was kind of neat to see that I was near the top here. Uh, in early March, a writer for the Black Vault contacted GVSC Public Affairs seeking an update on the work with To The Stars Academy and the CRADA we shared with them. At the request of the DOD's task force that was set up to work the various UFO related topics, we contacted that task force's public affairs officer to shift the query into their hands on May 5th. No further details at this time. Status, awaiting confirmation from DOD task force of receipt of query. Here's what's interesting about this is, have you figured out who that would be? And it looks like now the United States Army, in addition to all of the other agencies that has enlisted the help of Susan Goff, has now done so themselves. And in regards to this CRADA uh, with To The Stars Academy, internally, they were saying to the UAP task force and Susan Goff that apparently they're kind of keeping abreast of all of this and that they are involved as well. I was surprised to see that because no one ever told me that my inquiry about the CRADA with the United States Army was going back to the Department of Defense in likely Susan Goff's office because she would be the PAO for the UAP task force. What was also interesting is why is the UAP task force involved? So now that concern that I had stated a couple years ago that you were walking back these pieces, I see this as now that those test results that were that were per the contract going to be shared uh, with the United States Army in exchange for use of their equipment so TTSA could essentially figure out what they have is going to the UAP task force. So it has broadened widely from that agreement that it was just going to be the GVSC or sharing within the US Army. Now it's going to the task force, which works with pretty much every government agency. And so that is that concern that although on the surface, that crater looked fun and good and, and dandy, uh, you can see behind the scenes here, it has broadened. And the fact that I wasn't aware that my stuff was going over to likely Susan Goff, uh, it showed me that a lot of, of, of roads now, even though we already knew that, more roads are leading to the office of Susan Goff, who uh, essentially is controlling the narrative, but, but seemingly it's broadening and broadening to areas that, in my opinion, it shouldn't. So when I started asking about the updates, you know, were there reports and so on, uh, internally, they were trying to figure out were there. Now, what I was told uh, months ago was no, that there was no update. But keep in mind, public affairs officers aren't always in tune with what's, you know, essentially really taking place or unfolding. Why? Because if there's something that's uh, ongoing, or it hasn't reached their office yet, or 
for, th there's a multitude of reasons. I mean, they do have a lot of access, more access than what most people realize. However, uh, the public affairs officers still sometimes can miss things. So I already had cases filed to search internally for the documents on either communications with TTSA, the reports that were generated, what was going on. And you can see here on May 5th, uh, somebody in all the blackout redactions, those are all exemption B6, that's privacy information. So those are people, their personal information or names, uh, mostly names that are blacked out because they do keep that private. Uh, this was sent to, again, uh, to the GVSC, uh, another person who is in charge of the CRADA. Can you provide me an update on the attached CRADA? It is, uh, is it still active and have you received any reports from the company? The uh, batch of documents that I'll post next week, there's a bunch of back and forth. Uh, nothing really of note other than it was just kind of getting passed around. Finally, from what I could deduce about it, this was the person that was essentially in charge of that CRADA agreement. And they said, no, Redacted is planning to obtain more samples. Now that's pretty straightforward, short and to the point, but why is it important? Who's obtaining more samples? I would assume TTSA. The fact that this redaction is so small, I, I'm, I, I rarely do it where you measure characters and go, well, what could that be? Uh, I'm not really sure. It could be the initials. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm open to suggestions here, uh, but it was so small that I figured that maybe they had just a, a you know, a, a code, a word or letter, you know, to, to reference the CRADA agreement. I'm not really sure, but it could have been referencing TTSA. I took it as that TTSA is not doing anything because they're trying to obtain more samples. Why that wouldn't pertain to the United States Army or GVSC is because they're not supplying any material. They're supplying the equipment. So there's really kind of only one person or entity that could be, which would be uh, TTSA. So in May of this year, nothing has happened. Nothing. Now, I'll, I will absolutely 100% be fair and say we're dealing with a pandemic. So I get it. Uh, it you know, things can happen. However, there have been times where I believe, and this is what I'm still working on in the story, that they could have done their testing and yet nothing has happened. Now I spoke with TTSA and I'll get to that in a moment. Why, if, if my uh, interpretation of that is correct, and again, I'm open to other interpretations of who is collecting more samples, but I think it's obvious. What you're seeing on the screen here is a slide from a October of 2018 presentation given by Luis Elizondo. And these were at the time, so that's 2018, the pieces of material connected to UAPs uh, in some form or another. Some of these are known. Uh, that, that you can dig into each image. I think the majority of them are. Uh, I've heard one or two, some people couldn't figure out. I, I, to be honest with you, it's been a while since, since I really dug into each and every image. Um, I will say that I've, I've known about some of these. This, this particular one, let me point on the right screen. This particular one, obviously Linda Moulton Howe uh, was on this, this channel uh, quite some time ago giving the uh, very detailed breakdown about this piece and what its significance is. This one here, you'll recognize from a television show that I produced many years ago uh, from the History Channel. And I actually profiled this piece not only on UFO Hunters, if you were a fan of that show, it was in season three, but I also introduced it to the television audiences in a documentary I produced uh, also for History Channel also called UFO Hunters, but not connected to the Bill Burns series, uh, which came quite a long time later. Uh, UFO Hunters was just the name of the documentary that we had done, and we were profiling people uh, instead of um, essentially a case or something like that. It was a fun show to do. But this particular piece we profiled there. A couple other ones I've, I've dealt with on and off, but regardless, these are the, the pieces that... Uh, 
that were shown that Luis Elizondo said in his lecture, these are actual photographs of material in our possession. So they at least have this many, I count uh, probably 12 within here, not sure if you want to count these as more than one, but re regardless, 12 pieces to test. If you have 12 pieces that are connected to UAPs, why wouldn't you do it? And I'm not really sure. So I wanted to make sure that I was understanding the story correctly in the documents and the history, followed it for a couple of years, and I want to make sure I'm accurate. So I reached out to TTSA. To my surprise, they responded, uh, and to their credit. So I want to you know, give them a public thanks for that, because for quite a long time, uh, they would not respond at all. And so you'll see a lot of older articles, you know, contacted TTSA, no response, contacted TTSA, they didn't respond. Uh, they did hear, uh, but it didn't add much. Thank you for your inquiry in this regard. We must refer you to our SEC filings, press release on our website, and other public disclosures regarding the CRADA. We're not able to make any additional information available at this time. No links, no references to what they're talking about, no nothing. So I was back to essentially scrounging through their SEC filings and trying to figure out what they meant. The best that I could deduce, because I went through everything that I could find, the best that I could deduce was what they were referring to was this, a transcript from the 2021 meeting that they had for shareholders. So this particular story I'm working on is probably not going to be a surprise to shareholders that they haven't done anything. Because what they uh, said here, specifically Tom DeLong, CEO of the company, as announced earlier in 2019, we entered into a collaboration agreement with the US Army. This was the continuation and next step of our Atom project to analyze and advance our understanding of the collected exotic materials. The scope of the Army agreement covered metamaterial science, advanced communications, vehicle camouflage, and beamed energy propulsion. This contract spans five years, given the Army, uh, giving the Army access to TTSA data to support Army research. In return, TTSA gains access to scientific expertise that accelerates the quality and pace of our research. We kicked off this partnership in early 2020 with excitement, hosting the principal officers in the US Army at our headquarters in San Diego. Unfortunately, shortly thereafter, the pandemic took over and all operations affiliated with our project were closed due to safety concerns or redirected to focus on other government priorities concerning the national state of emergency. As there seems to be light on the horizon to the end of the health crisis, I am confident we will have some interesting progress to report as the year progresses. So I wanna make sure that I put that in there. That, and that's an acceptable explanation that it's COVID. You know, I mean, COVID shut everything down. The last piece of the puzzle, and I don't have an answer for you guys yet, uh, I'm hoping to get that Monday, is you'll see internally that the GVSC never made reference to the fact that they were closed or that the facilities were shut down or that there is nothing to report because the, of COVID. It was because what we can, uh, I hate to word, use the word assume, but let's call it deduce from the documents that it's TTSA that's trying to get more samples. Again, I'm open to other interpretations from that. I just don't see it. So what are they waiting for? Going back to that slide with all of the pieces that they have, granted, 11 out of the 12 may be absolutely nothing, but what if they have something? Their facilities are there. And internally, the GVSC says, yeah, they're, you know, there's nothing here. Still active, but nothing here because they're going for more material. So what that means, I'll let you guys decide. That last piece of the puzzle, why I didn't publish Friday, was what is the Army going to say? If they come back to me and say, um, you know, the, the facilities have been shut down for a year and a half, uh, I'll absolutely publish that. That's not a problem. Um, I'm giving you guys all the information that I have at this point uh, on this with the open-ended question of, you know, what's going on? Like, why... If you guys are sitting on, let's put it this way, if you guys are sitting on potentially the biggest discovery of mankind, right, you, you've got pieces of potentially alien spacecraft, I get it, COVID is a huge concern. But we are living our daily lives, we are, we are going forward, we are moving forward. 
So if they are not locked down and internally they're saying nothing about being closed, what is the holdup? And we keep seeing uh, stuff about entertainment, the entertainment division, and there's so many entertainment projects in development and uh, in production, and which is great, uh, all my best wishes. But that means that they're working on stuff. So if the army is open, I would think that potentially alien pieces of something uh, would be the best stuff that you could work on. But that's just me. Uh, but that is kind of the update. And um, we'll see what happens next week. I'll publish the rest of it. Here's the last story, and then we'll open up the lines. Uh, the last story was uh, somewhat UFO related. The documents ended up not being, uh, even though it was about Bob Lazar of the Area 51 fame. Uh, starting about two, three years ago, I started going after uh, FBI files on United Nuclear. That's his company that he is uh, uh, the owner of and still in operation today. I'm a science geek. Uh, there's some really cool stuff, I'm not going to lie, uh, on his website. Uh, for all you Area 51 Bob Lazar fans, uh, he's got some Area 51 signed posters and stuff like that that you can purchase, uh, but also a lot of science, you know, stuff like that. And so uh, he runs this company. And to my surprise, there was, uh, you know, quite a hefty FBI file. And even though I know Bob was in trouble with the law and I knew that United Nuclear at one time got in trouble with the law, or at least one that I could think of, uh, I was surprised that there was this kind of wide spanning file. So I had rounded down the file just because it would take about six years to get literally that was the estimate. So I rounded it down to a couple key years. And that's what I published. Why um, I wanted to point this out is that the motivation for this was the 2017 raid of United Nuclear, which was outlined in Jeremy Corbell's uh, documentary. It was very much framed that the FBI slash police were going in there and storming, essentially looking for element 115. That was the secret alien fuel that Bob Lazar had smuggled out of Area 51 and kept somewhere. Uh, I know that there's a, a lecture by George Knapp who said that Bob had taken it out to some place in the desert and buried it. And that George knew at, at least at one point where it was. Um, again, it's that question of if you if you're sitting on the key to the universe here, you know why would we just sit on it and and just continue to hound on Lazar's education? I mean, blow this thing wide open. But regardless, um, there was no records. Now there's there's a little bit of confusion, so I want to clarify. I saw it on Twitter uh, that the 2017 raid away from element 115 was connected to a murder. That's that's true. Uh, I won't get into the legal gritty details of that. But uh, if you look at the article that I published on the Lazar FBI files, I link over uh, to another article that was written by Tim McMillan uh, that um, obtained the original like two page summary from the the police department on the case. The confusion was, well, there wouldn't be anything in United Nuclear's file because that was in regards to another uh, murder investigation. Let me say up front, I'm not making a conspiracy out of the fact that there's no 2017 era files in United Nuclear. Um, I find it interesting and intriguing, but I'm still pursuing that angle and trying to get other documents. But where I wanted to clarify, because uh, this was a question that was brought up, was that if it was tied to a murder investigation, it wouldn't be in United Nuclear's file and that uh, it's no surprise it didn't come up. For those who dabble in the FOIA or want to, there is something really key to requesting files through the Privacy Act or Freedom of Information Act with the FBI. A lot of people overlook this. Uh, I did for many years, so I'm passing it on to you guys. You add in there that you want to make sure that you're getting what are called cross references to the topic of your request. So whether that be on United Nuclear or Microsoft or uh, Marilyn Monroe or whomever or whatever you are requesting, when you request cross references, what they do is they search for files also that connect to and cross reference the topic of your request. In regards to United Nuclear, uh, that is what I did. And so the responsive records over the course of a couple years that I was negotiating with the FBI and um, uh, well, 
let me rephrase that. The negotiation was much shorter, but the case uh, has been going on for a couple of years. The negotiation then was trying to figure out out of the responsive material that they received uh, and found, which totaled about 1,000 uh, to 1,100 pages approximately. There was nothing in the 2000 time frame. Now, per my request, cross-references should have come up. Uh, they did not. So I'm still pursuing it. And again, not trying to make a conspiracy out of it. Uh, but for those who are interested in, in using that, make sure you use language that includes cross-references. Because if you don't, like I said, they'll just go to that central file and then they won't, won't give you anything. Uh, so add in that language is where I'm going with that. And for many years, I was, I was not, uh, not aware of that. Jetboy33, you've been a longtime supporter of this channel and me. Thank you so much for uh, obviously joining us in the chat and your support for the channel. So thank you. Thank you for that donation. So that is, I did have another slide. This was uh, the email, uh, the communication back in 2019 that showed that they, the responsive records had nothing concerning the FBI involvement in a police raid in 2017. So uh, again, still pursuing that. I don't find it a huge, gigantic uh, conspiracy, but uh, it's something of note nonetheless. So let me switch some graphics here. Uh, let me go ahead and put the telephone number on screen. I'm gonna cross my fingers, everything works right. If it doesn't, I'm going to pull the comments back up here. Let me know. Uh, if you can't get through on the phone, let me know. Uh, I would uh, really appreciate that. Let me see some of the comments here and pull up some of these as we wait for some phone calls. Um, Lu Shi, and thank you so much. You might want to post a how to, how to do file of FOIA uh, with tips. Uh, that is something that is uh, really requested and and I really need to buckle down and do it. Uh, it. It sounds more complicated than it is, but there's a lot of tips to go along with it. And I know that I uh, should do that and want to do that. Uh, so thank you for that suggestion. I wanted to highlight it because that is something that I, I feel we should definitely do. Dolan's Bar, thank you so much for that. I was looking at the the graphic on there trying to is that maybe an Irish pub, maybe, uh, by the logo there? Very cool, Dolan's Bar. Thank you for that. Really, really appreciate it. Artisan Tony, can you or do you have a video on the FOIA process? Very cool. Uh, appreciate you asking as well. Uh, yes. You know what? I, I really need to, to do that for you guys. So, uh, you know, thank you for the suggestion. And, uh, and, I'm, and I'm happy to do it. And we'll do it live, too, so that way you know, I can field questions. So let me kind of buckle down and make a presentation. So, so that way I can give you guys a good overview and, uh, and kind of go with it. What I will say about FOIA, cause it looks like a lot of people want to want to use it in here, which is so encouraging to me. One thing that I always want to say is you can never stop learning about the FOIA process. I mean, there's, there's something really, really, um, sorry, I'm switching something here. Um, there's something really simplistic, but also really complicated about the process and that you can dive into it and really get going right away. But in the same respect, you can um, learn things all the time. And, and that's, that's something that I always pass on that, in my opinion, there's never, there's never a FOIA expert. <laughs> there's no such thing because after 25 years, I, I'm learning all the time. Uh, so let me go to the phones here. Uh, I just had to reset something, so I'm hoping everything's working well. Uh, you're live on the air. Who's this? Hey, John, it's JT. It J is. JT with the honk. How are you, buddy? Good. I'm doing good. Just out here getting it done. I, uh, I love the fact that you did that. Thank you so much. For those who don't know, <laughs> I met JT out of all the hours of radio I've done. It was just such a great phone call. And uh, you're a, a truck driver, JT, and you gave the honk at the end to Jimmy Church and myself. There was just something so genuine yep, and cool about you as a person and your call. And and I'm so glad that we became friends after that. So so oh, thank so thank you absolutely. So so what can I do for you? You got a comment, question, toots? <laughs> um, question: Do you have any? I got two questions, real quick ones. Do you have any insight? Any insight on the 
Senate Intelligence Appropriation Bill, what that's going to include for the next uh, session of the UAP task force or dollar-wise or dates like yearly, quarterly reports or anything like that? Yeah, so I briefly went over that in the beginning of the show, and, and what, what I uh, profiled was the Air Force involvement. Uh, however, right. the... Uh, I, I think that there's there's a much bigger video to this, but in short, it looks like if everything goes forward and if everything passes as it's written now, it looks like there will be, I believe it's quarterly reports. I don't have it in front of me, but as it stands right now, there will be uh, reports that are submitted. So essentially it's more funding and and more more informing of of Congress and Senate of what is going on. Um, but the, where I'm apprehensive to say that that's going to happen is that they're so in their preliminary stages at this point uh, that we just don't know, that we, we don't know what is essentially going to uh, be passed and, and what, what makes it through. So there was a lot of concern with the 2021 bill that that UAP essentially mandate for the report would maybe fall out. Luckily, it didn't. So, you know, it, it's the long winded way of saying things are working, things are, are progressing, uh, but it still has a, a, a long way to uh, pass. For those who don't know, and I don't have his Twitter handle in front of me, but you can search for his name. Uh, D. Dean Johnson has really done an excellent job following the progression of these bills did it in 2021 and he's doing it again in 2022 it is a very confusing and complicated process but dean does an excellent job at kind of making these tweet threads and making it make sense uh so after the show i'll link it in the show notes so that way people can I have a direct link but but make sure you just search for d dean johnson and uh he's definitely following the progression as well all right thank you for that and then uh, real quick on uh, Luis Elizondo, I mean, he, they seem like that whole ever since, like a, after a couple of weeks after the report came out, they've been very quiet. Now, you may have had personal contact with him or whatever, but it just seems like that all dried up. All the leaks have now dried up and everything's dried up. Yeah. Somebody's like flipped the switch off. I just wanted your opinion on that. Or no. Do you have any insight you could give us on that? I wish I had insight. Uh, I've noticed the same. Uh, I have not uh, communicated with Mr. Elizondo in a little bit. I did send him a message uh, this week about the CRADA agreement. Uh, that was uh, more so as a courtesy. I don't think he can comment on it uh, just simply because he's, uh, according to what he has said publicly, not affiliated with TTSA anymore. But I also like to keep him updated on stuff like that if he cares. Um, I didn't hear back from him, uh, so I don't know you know, what's going on. But to your question about a lot of stuff seemingly just drying up. Yeah, uh, that that's, that's really, uh, you know, I, I commented on the media part of it. But really, with the momentum of those, we'll call them leaks and stuff like that surfacing from Jeremy Corbell and George Knapp. And, you know, um, Luis Elizondo has never leaked anything that, that I'm aware of, right. that's tagged to him. But it just seems like all of that has stopped. And and Somebody either flip the switch, yeah, yeah. Uh, now, hopefully, maybe there, this is the calm before the storm, JT. Who knows? And to, we'll wake up on Monday That's morning, right. and you know, we'll have a, a triangle UFO video coming out of the water. I don't know, but yeah, right. yeah. I I I don't know what to what to make of it. You know, I I really don't. Uh, with the with the government side, I'm curious to know after that report was published. It was said by the DNI that 90 days thereafter, they were set to update Congress again. Now, the question mark for me that nobody's really addressed uh, is, will that be public at all? Is it even a report? You know, I mean, we don't, right. we don't know. And um, a lot, I think a lot of people had some false hope, like, all right, we're getting another report in 90 days. Uh, there's no indication of that. So moving forward, I think we're really going to have to allow that process to unfold, which will then okay. set the stage for the years to come. Because if they start closing right. the door on all of that, 
I think there's a fat chance that we will, you know, get absolutely nothing uh, when it comes to UAPs, and they'll try and keep a tight lid on it uh, from here on out. Very well. Very well. Yeah. I appreciate you letting me get in on a call, and uh, all the hard work you do and all the little surprises I get in the mail from you is like, wow, okay. I mean, that takes a lot of effort and time on your part. doesn't seem like much maybe for one person, but it's, you know, you're doing that for everybody, and that's pretty cool. Well, I appreciate, so, I appreciate that. Anyway, so I just want to say hello to all the vault heads, as I call them. Vault heads, I love and, it. Uh, <laughs> yep, and numbers 624 to 26, everybody. God bless you, and just take it easy. Have a good weekend, and thank you, John. And this is for all the vault heads out there. <laughs> I love it, JT. Thank you so much, man. You call in any time. Yeah, it's very rare that I get a chance to call in because of, of my weird schedule, you know. And you just happened to hit it right on tonight. Thank you. Well, I'm glad I did. Thanks again, man. You have a great uh, – be safe out there on the roads, too, and have a great night. All right. Thank you. Thanks, John. Such a great guy. Really is cool. Uh, so I appreciate that. Vault Heads, that's a new one. Uh, so I wrote that down. We'll, 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 uh, we'll have to, to credit JT for the Vault Heads. Uh, so Matthew Riot didn't want you to think I missed you there. Thank you so much. Yes, the back hurts. Come do some dabs, buddy. My back hurts. For those who missed it, I did something to my back so I can barely move. Uh, so I uh, uh, I appreciate that, Matthew. I might take you up on it. I really enjoy all. Oh, let me see if I can. Why isn't this popping up? Pop up, pop up. Judy, I see your. I'm so sorry. I, I don't know why it's not popping up. Uh, okay, Judy McAuliffe. Uh, for, I don't know why it's not popping up, so I apologize. I really enjoy all you do, plus your Hollywood ventures. Judy, thank you for that. I'm sorry. I would put your name and lights on there, uh, and I'm clicking on it, and it's just not going on there, so I don't know why, but I appreciate it. Uh, GD, that one pops up. So, Judy, I do apologize about that. Is it possible some army analysis of samples has occurred, but results not ready to release yet? Absolutely. Uh, that is a possibility. What I, that was my intention to reach out to TTSA because the documents I got were from May. So a lot has happened since then. Uh, however, by them pointing me to their meeting minutes and press releases, there was no press release on anything. And the meeting minutes has uh, obviously blamed COVID. I'm totally open though to that. And that's why when, and, and I don't want to just pick on TTSA here, but when you write a story and you want to be as accurate as possible, speaking in vagueness and not being helpful with, like how hard would it have been to give me the same exact statement with a link to something? Uh, like, hey, we can't really add anything to this, but here's our minutes or, here's our press release that we think you should look at or something. And instead you just go, yeah, sorry, we can't add anything. Here's 12,000 pages to look through. So, you know, figure it out. Um, that, that makes it really difficult, you know, and when somebody is trying to genuinely be as accurate as possible and give you guys all of the, the information that would have been helpful. Is there something that they just haven't released yet? Quite possibly. But again, Internally at the army, it just seemed like nothing was nothing was going on. And that was also the official statement as well, that there was absolutely, you know, nothing there. So that's what's uh, kind of frustrating about it. Let me see one more. Uh, Nick Northcutt, thank you uh, for that. We need more people like you pushing this issue on our leaders. We deserve to know where they stand. Cheers. Nick, cheers to you. Thank you for that support. Absolutely, uh, we need more. Uh, here's a shout out to my friends over at the uh, Unidentified Celebrity Review and Luis Jimenez, uh, Michael Mataluni, Rather Be Squidding. I don't know if you guys are in the chat. Uh, I've, I'm <laughs> not really doing a good job keeping up on all this. Uh, but uh, if you guys are out there, uh, they are doing the Big Phone Home. Uh, this is the Big Phone Home 2. And uh, they are pushing the elected leaders to do something about this. Now, I rarely get behind ventures like that. But after meeting Luis, meeting Michael, meeting Rather, meet, and those are the three main, uh, main individuals. There's a lot of other people involved. Please, I know that I'm not naming everybody. 
uh, but spearheaded by, by those three gentlemen. Uh, they're doing an awesome job. And they did one earlier this year. Uh, it's thebigphonehome.com is how to uh, get to their website. Uh, they've got a great and entertaining show on YouTube that I would check out. Uh, but they do a great job. They've got a lot of passion behind what they do, and they're pushing their elected leaders uh, to do something about this, you know, and to to figure it out. So that's what they that's what they are uh, up to, and I want to make sure that you guys check that out uh, as well. Let me go ahead and um, let me hit the the phones. I'm sorry to keep you on hold there for a little bit. Who's this? Oh. Hi, John. This is Bob of the way. How are you doing, sir? Good. How are you? I just. Just fine. Um, this is a fascinating topic. I really appreciate you doing the show. Um, I was just curious to uh, see, kind of gather your thoughts <clears throat> on uh, whether you thought Howard Stern had a big penis. Okay. Should I blast his number out? Sorry for the crank call on that. Uh, let me see. Anonymous Rex, any thoughts on the 2019 Bainbridge Island Tic Tac case now being highlighted on the new show? encounter UFO. So let me see, I, and I'm surprised this hasn't come up yet. Uh, I assume by by the by the show uh, UFO, you're talking about the Showtime one, I'm trying to think the Bainbridge Island Tic Tac case now being highlighted on the new show encounter UFO. Actually, then let me rephrase that No, encounter UFO. I'm not sure what uh, anonymous Rex which show that is. The Bainbridge, though, I believe that I've heard someone. T I don't want to speak out of turn here, uh, but I believe I've heard somebody talk about this publicly. So if it wound up in a television show, that's good. Uh, I believe uh, I have an open request on that and, and looking into it. So I will have to check my records on it and see what's out there public, but, but obviously, uh, on a television show, I'm just not sure which encounter UFO that show is. So, uh, if you can put it in the, the show is on. Okay. So I'm going through the comments. The show is on T and E T and E T and E. Sorry. I don't know what T and E is. I'm probably just going to draw a blank, but, uh, l let me know. And I'll try and keep a watch on the, uh, you know, watch on the comments for you, but I'm not familiar with the show encounter UFO isotope ratio data would only take a day at most to generate. I smell a rat. Bo, thank you for that donation. Um, this is the thing about isotopic ratio. And, and I dealt a lot with it on the, on the uh, history channel show where I profiled what is now in the hands of TTSA. And it is number one, very expensive. Uh, but number two, there's not a whole lot of places that can do it. And you're absolutely right. The places that can, which I assume would be the United States Army, which I assume is why they're doing this agreement, could probably come up with very fascinating results very quickly. And that goes back to my comment that if you're doing your television production or your movies uh, through TTSA's entertainment division, that's great. I truly, I've always wished Tom DeLong. Uh, him being a successful entrepreneur, luck, and what my best wishes for those ventures. Um, there's nothing bad I can say about it. However, when I talk about their analysis and CRADA agreement, if you're doing the entertainment division, why would you not just take a little bit of time to go and get those answers that could probably be determined very quickly? And and that's that's what I don't understand, and they're not doing it. So... That said, you have a great point. I, I wish I had a better answer for you. Um, I, I wish TTSA would open up to their investors. Their investors, I think, deserve an answer. Uh, and per their investors and the meeting minutes that they gave to all of their investors, they fell back on the COVID excuse. Now, that I don't want to diminish that. That is something that's very important and something that has altered all of our lives. But again, you can't in one breath say, uh, you know, we're doing all this entertainment stuff and we're in production on X, Y, and Z, and then blame COVID for not doing the tests. If the army comes back to me on Monday and says, yeah, we've been shut down for a year and a half. Great. I, I will absolutely publish that and say, this is where we're at. But internally, those documents did not produce any evidence that they were, that they were shut down. And if TTSA was able to communicate with more statements, maybe we can get some clarity. Let me hit the uh, phones again. Uh, who's this? This is Jamie Moore from Kentucky. 
Hey there, how are you? Doing well. Uh, just have a quick question for you. Uh, I was wondering what you think about Haim Ashed and the validity of his story, if you're familiar with him. Uh, if I'm familiar with who again? Haim Ashed, the Israeli. Oh, yes, 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 uh, yes. I'm, I'm, yes, I'm sorry. I didn't uh, catch who you were referring to. Yes, familiar vaguely with the story, but yes, familiar. Mm. Uh, see if you've done any uh, research into that. You know, it, it kind of gets your opinion on it. Yeah, no, and I appreciate the question. I it really reminds me of like a story like Paul Hellyer, who recently passed away here in the last week or two, where a government official or somebody that's seemingly connected comes out with a story, but doesn't bring a whole lot of evidence with them. Now that doesn't take away from the story, but it's very hard to verify. Uh, information like that and i think with mm. with uh this particular case with, P with the late paul hellier uh and quite a few uh, doing the same it's very hard and so for me i'm very much a very much a nuts and bolts i need evidence kind of guy and if somebody comes to me with a story i need mm. that kind of hard evidence to go along with it and albeit it is very interesting and intriguing and i i try and follow you know, uh, developments like that, it, there's not a lot you can do with it. Mm -hmm. Anybody to kind of, he said there's connection with uh, American astronauts. Is there anybody to kind of get a list of astronauts that are still here on Earth? Well, the, yeah, the, the, the astronaut angle to a lot of this is, is also very intriguing to me. Um, I have spent time with, with quite a few astronauts. I was raised uh, where my dad worked on the space shuttle. I got to meet quite a few. Uh, when it comes mm -hmm. to like their UFO encounters, what makes it really muddy when you get to astronaut encounters uh, is that a lot of the stories are embellished and have kind of taken on a life of its own. Uh, prime example, when I first started the Black Vault back in 96, I had written Neil Armstrong and it was based on all of the photographs of him on the surface of the moon and uh, really kind of well-known in the UFO field where there's like a ring of light above him. Uh, and the story was that Neil Armstrong saw things on the crater edge. I don't know if you're familiar with those stories, but those have circulated for Thanks. years and years and years. Uh, and, and Neil Armstrong's administrative aide actually wrote me back and, and apparently asked, at least the, as the, the, the letter goes, asked Neil Armstrong about my, my question. And he said, none of it was true. All of those stories were, were bunk. And so that's what kind of makes it really challenging unless you get an astronaut, you know, on the record talking about UFOs, which some have done. Uh, but at least that, that to me, uh, there's usually uh, photographs or videos to go along with it, you know, where you, you have things that are seen on space shuttle missions and so on and so forth. So you have that to back it up. Um, but those those in itself are very challenging. You know, it's 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 mm -hmm. really hard to verify stories like that. All right, I guess that's about it. I gotta I, head back to work. I I appreciate that. Just yeah, I don't know if out. I answered your question good enough, but I appreciate the question nonetheless. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. I appreciate. All right. Thanks for that call. Bo, again, thank you so much for your um, uh, your support here. I spent 40 years doing mass spe spectroscopy is, I, I believe, the short form there. It's cheap and easy if you have the equipment. Many labs have the equipment. So mass. OK, so this goes also to it. And you're going to be smarter than, than me on this. Um, and so maybe I'm using the wrong terminology. But what I can say is that when we were doing those shows on science, we did quite a few when it came to UFO uh, testing and, and stuff like that. The spectroscopy was not the expensive part. The isotopic ratio abundance test, if I remember correctly, and I'm going back years uh, in this very old brain of mine. Remember, I injured my back, so I think I'm falling apart. Uh, but the, the isotopic ratio abundance test was the expensive one. And although this wasn't, you know, yesterday when we were doing it, it was a, f a few years ago, quite a few, uh, maybe eight now, uh, maybe eight or nine. Uh, it was very, very expensive. Now, I assume in the eight or nine years, it's gotten a lot less expensive, more prevalent and so on. Uh, so again, you, you have excellent points. I just wanted to differentiate with my uh, admitted ignorance on all of the terminology there. 
uh, that's what I my experience was eight or nine years ago trying to get the same as well. So, but Bo, you bring up excellent points. I, I truly, I, I, you're sitting on the key to the universe. I'll say it a thousand times. Why don't you just go and get the test done and figure out what's going on? Uh, why not? It's beyond me. So uh, let's go to the phones. Who's this? Uh, good evening, uh, uh, Mr. Greenwald. It's Rob from Florida. And thank you very much for taking my call. Uh, you're very welcome. Thank you. Uh, thank you for calling. What can I do for you? You bet. It's such a, a pleasure to speak to you. I've been following your work for years. Don't change a thing and carry on. I appreciate your objectivity and the way that you uh, try to vet the evidence. Um, the question for you I have, I'd like to refer to the chapter in the Air Force Academy physics textbook that was used on or about 68 through 70, which I'm sure you're familiar with that. Yes. Okay. How has that been authenticated? I, I know Lee Spiegel got it from, stated he received it from Dr. Hynek, and Dr. Hynek said it was used in the textbook. Do you know of anybody that's actually held that textbook in their hands and seen that chapter? And I'm not trying to doubt its authenticity, but that would be a very valuable authentication because that, that's a pretty important document. Yeah. Um, off the top of my head, it is a fantastic question. I don't know. Uh, I don't, I don't have personal, um, I don't have a personal reason to doubt the authenticity either. Uh, but in the same respect, no, I, if, if memory serves and I'll have to look back years and years ago, I tried to track one down via FOIA, you know, a lot of those things you can get textbooks sure. and so on and so forth and came up empty. But the problem with textbooks like that is sometimes they're not, not saved like normal government reports or records. So I, it was kind of like a dead end, but it was a dead end that didn't really mean anything. But I'll have to look back and get you a better answer on that. But in regards to somebody physically holding that textbook, off the top of my head, no. I, I just know the stories of uh, how you just uh, put it, uh, Lee Spiegel through J. Allen Hynek uh, and going back, you know, what is that, 50, 60 years? Uh, it's a long time, True. you know, long time ago. So, um yeah, no, I wish I had a, a, a better answer for you. I just am not aware. And in your opinion, has it been authenticated uh, to your satisfaction? That particular document, again, I just don't have any reason to doubt it. I, I don't. Um, you know, it's not like an MJ-12 controversial document. Uh, Dr. J. Allen Hynek, you know, was, was obviously very careful with, I think, things he put his name behind. So yeah, from what I recall, and I'll look back, I just don't think of anything that uh, stuck out to me as saying, nah, this, this can't be, you know, can't be real. Well, you know, when you read that document, it's, it's interesting what it does not say. And what it does not say is, uh, you know, Air Force students uh, pay no attention to this. We studied it. Uh, there's nothing there. You're going to get, uh, don't waste your time and resources on it. Uh, you know, it doesn't say that. Yeah. In fact, it goes into quite detail saying that they think maybe perhaps three or four civilizations are, could be visiting. You know, it's couched in could be and maybes. However, you know, they, they do make statements in there that are quite alarming. Yeah, it's been a while since I've looked at it, but, but yeah, I recall seeing stuff like that. Um, that's why I think that the context of the entire book and physically holding the entire thing in your hand would be key to see exactly, you know, what was the context of what they were saying. Um, you know, a lot of times I, I use this as a silly example, but it's a good example nonetheless, that the context of the information in a document is key. And sometimes you lose that context. And the example I give is a, um, a preparedness plan for a zombie apocalypse and as <laughs> silly as that sounds it exists and yeah. uh there were classified versions and references to it it's called uh, con plan 8888 and i've had it on the black vault for years now out of context i tell you that and go look that they're they're preparing just on the off chance there's a zombie apocalypse they've prepared for it there's this preparedness plan all of that is true the context, however, is that it was actually a, a, a training manual on how mm -hmm. to create these preparedness plans. 
and the zombie apocalypse was chosen because it was the most generic and unlikely thing ever to happen. And so it wasn't leaning towards, you know, hurricane destruction or a massive earthquake. That was just generic. And so they made this preparedness plan. So out of context, you know, things can can absolutely be skewed a certain way. Um, I'm not saying that happened with this Air Force manual. I'm just saying that, you know, context is always key. So was this something that they were truly teaching their students? Was this, you know, something else? I, I don't I don't know. But in regards to legitimacy, I, I just have not seen anything to show that it was a fake. Yeah, that's that's been my my conclusion as well. And, you know, perhaps you can ask David Marler. I mean, if anybody ought to know, it would be him or have a copy. I mean, he's got a copy of yeah. everything else, it seems like. Yeah, he uh, he's got an amazing collection. I got to see it in person uh, quite a few years ago uh, when I was doing a lecture and got to go to his home and I, you know, D D which David will be on this channel here in the next few weeks. Uh, so stay tuned for that. He, he's a great individual, but his collection oh, is unmatched. I mean, it is unbelievable what he has. And I give him so much credit for taking the time to collect everything. So I, I wrote it down while you were saying that, cause I'll ask him about it and, and, uh, specifically about that manual and, and see, did he find one in his, in his trek to collect everything known to man when it comes to UFOs, uh, or if, if he knows, but I'll, I'll write that down or I've written well, that I'm, down and I'll, I'll, I'll ask him. Oh, that's great. Well, I'm currently, my wife and I are currently touring the United States and he is one stop on our tour. I want to make a donation to his, uh, reference library there and, and visit with him. So I'm really looking forward to that. And, but, uh, you know, I'm not surprised if somebody doesn't have a copy of that textbook because as an internal matter, and, you know, they, they got rid of it after about 1970 or so, so they probably all got destroyed. But, you know, there may be one or two somewhere out in a used bookstore somewhere. Yeah, that, yeah it's the used bookstores that are amazing. I've, I've told the story a couple times, but it's like um, uh, Rob Mercer finding old Project Blue Book books oh. and reports and stuff in, in a garage, like it, on Craigslist that was found in somebody's garage. You never know where you find this stuff, but... Uh, yeah, gr great question, and I'll make sure that I ask Dave about it. And I'll, I'll wrap up by saying, well, you know, it's interesting because David Marlar got some uh, original photos of the L.A. Uh, the the uh, L.A. Battle UFOs over LA. in 1942. Yeah. Those came from a garage sale from the AP photographer. I mean, that is a fantastic story. Yeah, yeah, I love. I'm telling you that I geek out about stories like that. It's very, very cool. Yeah, me too. All right. Well, thank you so much, and uh, it's been a real pleasure to talk to you. Awesome. You as well. Thanks for calling. Call anytime. Yes, sir. You bet. Good thank night. you. All right. Couple. Uh, let me see here. Couple super chats to get to here, and thank you for all of this, Oliver Dro. John, ever read this? Interesting. They offer a reason for alien waves every twenty years or so. The name of the article is "Inflation Theory Implications for Extraterrestrial Visitation." Link in the chat. Oh, Oliver, thank you for the link. Uh, I will definitely look it up off the top of my head. That doesn't sound familiar. So I'll, I will um, uh, definitely do that and see what's in that document. So uh, thank you for that. And thank you for the support of the channel. A couple more to get to here, and then we'll go back to the phones. Uh, GD again, thank you. Uh, not just isotope analysis that is of interest. The structure of the sample is also of interest, e.g. three micron bismuth layer and its properties. Absolutely. Um, yeah, you, you're, you're spot on. Uh, and, and again, that's science that's out of my realm. So I won't even pretend to give you an eloquent answer, uh, other than we need those answers, you know, and why they're not doing it. I'm not really sure. Jean Francois, and I, I'm going to botch the last name, so I'm not going to try, but Jean Francois, thank you so much for that. Really appreciate it. Uh, obviously from Canada, no question. Just want to thank you for your work. Well, thank you for your support. And I really do appreciate uh, that support of the channel uh, and myself. So, so you're very, very welcome. But thank you. A couple more here, and then we'll go back to the phones. Artisan Tony, if FOIA only covers executive branch, government, our FBI and CIA docs gotten. Uh, Tony, I'm, I'm not sure exactly what you mean by that. So just a clarification, though, executive branch, when you get into the White House, 
uh, you are not covered through FOIA. That's through the Presidential Records Act. And everything is exempt until the president comes out of office. It gets tran all of his records or through the administration for the most part. There are there's, there, it gets complicated. There are exceptions through the executive office of the president that are open through FOIA. However, the majority of all White House records, presidential records are all through the Presidential Records Act, gets transferred over to the National Archives. The National Archives then will run the library of the president. All of that stuff goes transferred over there. And then, then FOIA requests uh, apply. Are FBI and CIA docs gotten? Um, again, I'm not 100% I'm not sure what you mean by that, so I apologize, Tony. Try and put it in the chat, and I'll try and catch, uh, catch the clarification. I'm happy to address it. I'm just not sure what you mean. FBI, though, CIA, they're all open uh, to FOIA requests. I've hit all of them and uh, m thousands of times over. Mahmoud, uh, is, thank you so much for that. Is it possible to get radar data from the Nimitz encounter via FOIA? Without that, it seems all we have to go on is witness testimony. Yeah, I know that uh, uh, people like Dave uh, Beatty, who is a great researcher, uh, been on this uh, program before. I don't want to speak on his behalf because I don't want to screw anything up, but I know that he has gone after the deck logs and radar data and stuff like that. Uh, and a lot of stuff in cases like this and even the later what we call like the drone swarm encounters, the drone encounters uh, is missing and it's just not there. So I don't wanna say specifically that yes, Dave has said that because I don't wanna speak for him, but he would be the one to ask about that. Uh, but from what I recall, no, all of that is, is gone. Uh, according to testimony by uh, people from the Princeton, uh, that the tapes were taken. So all sorts of stuff is, uh, is missing and, and not around. So let me make sure I'm all, I think I got everybody there. Make sure I didn't miss anything. Let me go back to the phones. Who's this? Hi, John. This is Pat from Philly. I'm your bar owner that sent in the Super Chat. Hey there. How are you? I'm great, man. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. And uh, thank you for the uh, uh, thank you for the support on everything. Yeah, no, no worries, buddy. Um, so the reason why I'm calling is, number one, thank you for everything you're doing. I think you're excellent at what you do. You're you're open-minded yet skeptical of a lot of things, and I, I think you're um, probably the most uh, black and white and level-headed that I that I see in this. And I, listen, I pay attention to this big time. Like I'm very, very interested in it. But I wanted to know what your thoughts were on why the TTSA split happened, and I'll give you my theory uh, afterwards. Sure. Uh, when you say split, you're talking about Christopher Mellon, Luis Elizondo, Chris and Lou. Yeah. Um, uh, Steve Justice as well, or are you just talking about the... Well, the, all of it. Okay, I, okay. I'd love to hear what you think. And the only reason I, I ask is because I think there's different answers. I mean, I think someone like okay. Steve Justice, and I'm surprised this hasn't come up yet, uh, which I'm happy to, to, to address, but the biggest heat I got uh, through the Showtime show that I did, uh, I would say the most controversial thing was I posed that some of these guys came together potentially not for the sole reason but potentially with money as a motivating factor and with steve i don't want to say that that's exactly why he did it but i would say that with his departure it's indicative that that some of these people that were involved in ttsa were probably looking at it as a job and the original vision of 50 million dollars of of raised capital that would turn and balloon into something bigger uh, and, and much more lucrative was probably appealing to at least a few of them as being a driving factor. So, um, you know, as much as we all want to think it's all about disclosure and, and all for the greater good, I think money is a motivating factor with Steve justice's departure. I think, yeah, you know, it's, it's about supporting our family. There's nothing wrong with that in regards to, to Elizondo and, 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 uh, Christopher Mellon leaving. I think that, uh, for, for me anyway, I, I don't know. I think that there will be some other project uh, that they will be involved in, some other effort. I don't know if that stems from that they disagreed ultimately with the way TTSA was run. I don't know. Um, I asked Mr. Elizondo when I interviewed him on this channel, this was back in January now. That yeah, I had, remember that. Yeah. yeah, it had just unfolded, so he was very apprehensive, which which is totally fair but apprehensive of answering. I don't know if anybody's asked him on the 
74 million interviews he's done in the last few months um, on that. So why do I personally think? I think there's going to be another venture if, if I were to bet okay. money. Um, I think um, the Tucker Carlson appearance where all of a sudden we saw this sky fort, you know, blasted to everybody. Um, what is sky fort, you know, and, and like that was obviously attributed to Luis Elizondo. And so then I thought, OK, this is it. You know, that's the other organization. That is what they're talking about. But then that has kind of gone radio silent for a little bit. So long winded way of saying, I think it's another project. But what that project is, I'm not really sure. Did you read the novels that TPSA put out? I did not. All right. Um, so in, in they're, they're excellent reading, by the way. They're, they they go through quickly. Um, um, they're page turners. They really are. But in in the novels, it's basically like four four or five different characters that's, that's split up. And you jump back and forth in, in the chapters between the point of view of each character. Um, and one of them... And it's basically revolved around the TR3B project of the U.S. government. And this is what I think. I, I know that this was like a couple of years ago when this came out. But I know that Lou speaks on like there's absolutely no way that we have that technology. You know, it's not in our, um, it's not in our toolbox of the U.S. military. And I was always wondering if maybe there was some type of disagreement when it came down to that. I, it, there absolutely could be. I mean, I I speak on nothing but opinion, but the upper echelon of TTSA for me, from from an outside point of view, seems drastically different. And I'm sure there were yeah. rifts behind closed doors because when you look at the way Mr. Elizondo spoke in 2018 and 2019, uh, his tone has shifted a little bit, but he was very nuts and bolts back then. He yeah. was very you know, uh, pretty much just more hardcore evidence. You juxtapose that with Tom DeLong, and you've got a wildly different point of view. You know, then you add yeah. in Christopher Mellon, who is uh, from the position that he is, uh, not only, you know, but with public life and, and his government ties, but obviously being part of the Mellon family. Those are you know, you can't get across the spectrum any any better than that. So I, yeah. I would be, uh, and again, just based on opinion, I'd be curious to hear some of those behind closed doors conversations about what the best direction for TTSA was. Because you oh, have boy. the head of the snake, a th you know, however many heads that snake has, but they're being yeah. pulled in, in way too many di directions there. So, yeah, I, I'm sure that there was a lot more going on than than anyone was privy to. Um, two two more things quickly. Um, so I, I am fascinated with all of his long form interviews that he's been doing in the last few months over the summer. Uh, Elizondo speaking. Um, I search for them every day to see if anything news up, uh, new comes up. And I think the call or a couple before me noticed that things have gotten a lot more quiet in the last three weeks or so um, with Elizondo. But what I find really fascinating is the acknowledgement of a lot of old cases that had been brought around um, the, U the UFO community. Uh, for instance, the, the incident over Texas, over Bush's ranch, um, things like that. There's there an incident uh, off the coast of Puerto Rico, and Lou has spoke on some of these. And number one, I find it completely um, fascinating that, that they're looking at that and they're acknowledging that they've looked at that uh, in the past you know, as far as um, – a tip or, or whatever the, the acronyms were at the time where he was looking at those things. And, but why, my big question to you is, um, and I, I'd love, I mean, I don't think anybody really knows the answer to this, but why now, why is it all coming out now? Why is the push for this coming out now? I mean, it's always been, you know, from what we've gathered and, and you know, you have you know, your fingertips on more information than anybody else in the subject. Um, it's always been walled off. But why, why is it opening up now? What's your opinion on that? And um, I'll listen to it off the air. Thank you for everything. Too. And, and thank you for that. I really appreciate your phone call and your question. Um, why, why now is, a, is an amazing question that really I don't think anybody has an answer to. Um, there, there is obviously this very public push for information. A lot of people were thinking that this was disclosure. A lot of people thought this is, you know, this is where we are. Uh, this is, this is, you know, 
where we're heading, we're, we're going to be in disclosure. And we're not uh, because with that public push, with some people that were government insiders, you then have a, uh, we'll call it the the private, the, the, the inside, the government side that wants to squash it all. And even though there was, a, for me, the glimmer of hope was when the U.S. Navy in September of 2019 started going on the record saying, yes, we believe that these videos are unidentified aerial phenomena. That to me was a turning point in my head that we were going towards something that may be really fascinating. That door was shut uh, not too long after. They are trying to squash this. So this why now question um, may ultimately be that there is nothing going on, that we're appeasing the public push for information, saying, hey, we have a task force now, hey, we're looking into it, and so on and so forth. So the public's like, really? That's great, give us that information. And then the report comes out, it's absolutely nothing, and it bursts that bubble. Was that the objective? Was it to get the momentum by the push of the United States government saying, let's just, and, and I'll bring up the leaks again, why were they allowed to happen and why were there uh, comments on them so quickly by the Pentagon? And so was that part of a, a bigger uh, plot, <laughs> operation, plot, whatever it might be? Um, and so was it why now is, is because they're trying to destroy this topic. Uh, and, and that's still kind of unwritten. But I think it's a possibility. And, and I know I'll get hate mail for saying that. But you have to look at what's going on. You look at the leaks that have come out that were not extraordinary. You then look at how the skeptics can debunk it. You look at the internal war between the UFO community. And as a couple callers, yourself included, uh, who we just hung up with, uh, that you've noticed that everything is just kind of dried up. Is that the public interest going away? Because absolutely nothing happened with this report. And it was this gigantic hype. We're going to get a report. We're going to get this. We're going to get that. And absolutely nothing happened. Now, I still find it interesting. And I still think that there's a lot more to do. I still think that there's a lot more to discover. And I still think that there's a lot more that we all can collectively do. But if this was part of, a, of something else, um, that's unwritten for me. And I'm not really sure. So that why now question, we can't answer it. But to me, there are too many strange red flags that remain unanswered about this entire saga that I think we still need to push on. And sadly, I think there's a small portion of the general public that doesn't care anymore. And that's if I've learned anything in 25 years of researching government cover ups, it is the fact that time is the best weapon that the United States government can wield. And if you wait long enough, people will absolutely lose interest. So you have a core that doesn't care to answer those questions because they believe all this anyway. But the general public has now been sloughed off for a couple of years. They're on to something else. They're fighting whether or not masks should be in schools or we should go to the supermarket and mask. People, I think collectively, a lot of people have moved on because the bubble was burst. So I'll, I'll, I'll stop ranting on that. But it's, it's really kind of the long winded way of saying we don't know if there are underlying objectives here. We want to think it's all about truth and disclosure and so on and so forth. But is there something else going on? We can't, we can't, we can't say no at this point. Couple super chats. Uh, I'm going to get caught up and I'll get back to the phone. DT, uh, thank you again for all of your uh, support tonight. Senator Reed's letter on Lou Elizondo said ATIP was an unclassified program. How does that square with Mr. Elizondo's penchant for punting questions on grounds of confidentiality? Absolutely fantastic question and something that I have posed for quite some time. In a New York Magazine interview by Senator Harry Reid, uh, I forget off the top of my head what year this was, but this was uh, done by Senator Reid, and he said 80% of ATIP was unclassified. And he was saying he couldn't believe that journalists and mainstream media wasn't looking at it. 
No one has ever been able to answer the question for me of what is this 80%? Is he talking about the 38 DIRD reports? Uh, maybe, and that's fine. But there's no UFO data in there. Arguably, some people want to say Kit Green's report was, you know, UAP effects on the human body, whatever. But regardless, it just didn't scream as a UFO program to me through the OSAP days. So what is it that Harry Reid was referring to? We don't know. All of those reports were for official use only, with the exception of, I believe, two off the top of my head. And those were classified just simply because they were using technical data that obviously would encroach on a classified system. Why was everything else unclassified for official use only? So for those who aren't aware, for official use only or FOUO is not a classification. It's just an internal designation that the document then will still require review for release, but is not classified in nature. So nothing was except the, again, the, the two that were, um, I think they were dealing with lasers, but I, I uh, again, I, it's been a while since I looked at it. Regardless, the majority was not. So what is Harry Reid referring to? Going back to this question, there are a lot of fallbacks on it's classified or my NDA or it's classified, it's my NDA. And yeah, that's frustrating. I appreciate and can understand those security clearances. But it seems like if Harry Reid is saying, hey, 80% of this program and all the, the information that went along with it is all unclassified, mainstream media is not looking at it. Fine, keep the 20%, hide behind it, I don't care. Give me the 80% and let's play ball. And yet no one has been able to do that. For those curious, I have reached out to Harry Reid numerous times, uh, no response. So what is the information? Your guess is as good as mine. Let me get a little bit more caught up on these super chats. And I screw up. I probably screwed up. I hope I'm not missing anybody. Uh, so much fun to see the hundreds and hundreds of you uh, throughout screaming through this chat. So uh, it's a little tough for me to uh, pick out the comments. The super chats are the ones that are really highlighted. So that's why I'm able to uh, to pick those out. I apologize if I'm missing anything because this thing kind of keeps refreshing uh, on its own a little bit. So apologize. John Music. John, when do you think Mr. Elizondo's big news drop will happen? We can't lose momentum and most people know nothing about UFOs. We need big stuff now. Uh, I'm not sure what Mr. Elizondo said he was going to be dropping or what that news was. I will talk in generality that there are always people saying something big is coming. If that's Mr. Elizondo, I hope not. But if he said that something big is coming, I would hope that he would timestamp it. If he didn't, I have no idea. Um, the thing with me, even though I, I find value in what people say, and I look at it and I digest it, if it doesn't come through or there's no timestamp, what does it mean? I mean, there's so many people that say, Big things are coming. Just wait. You know, uh, it, teases are fine. I, I tease myself. It, it's it's good to get some kind of interest. The longest I've ever teased something was on a Friday for a Monday story, and I cringed when I did it. But there was actually a reason why I, I did it. Um, and and generally, when I tease, there's usually a reason why. Um, I do work with a lot of journalists uh, worldwide, and so sometimes if they see me maybe drop a hint that I'm dro uh, seeing uh, drop a hint that I'm publishing a story on something, they'll write me and then I can absolutely give them a, a heads up. So uh, it's a little bit to, to, to get that momentum because I don't have the reach that a lot of the media organizations that profile my documents do. And so that's why sometimes I do that. But there's always a reason. What I get tired of are those teases that are just open ended, like something big's coming, you know, just wait. Uh, I don't, I don't know when, but something big, it drives me nuts because there are so many that you get excited about. And, and this is part of marketing for some people. And it drives me nuts. They'll say, Oh, I, I got this big interview with someone. It's coming soon. It's coming to like six months later, you know, maybe something will get published or those types of teases. It, 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 I think it drives the community nuts. So going back to this, when will it happen? It's anybody's guess. I really, I don't do, I don't do those long open-ended teases. Well, I think if somebody says, Hey, uh, I'll, I'll use Jeremy Corbell as a prime example. When he teases, he at least delivers like not everybody's going to like what he publishes, 
But when he says high noon the next day, I set my alarm because I know that it's going to be there, you know? So kudos to him that we may not always agree, but when he says at high noon tomorrow, I'm going to tease or I'm going to drop something. That's awesome. I got no problem with that. You know, I mean, I, I, I wish that everything of course was published all at the same time and dumped on the internet, but I get it. So what this big news is, is anybody's guess. I know that this caller's been on hold for a while, and I apologize. Who's this? Hi, John. Big fan. This is Britt. Hi, Britt. How are you? <laughs> I'm good. How are you doing? I'm good, thank you. Uh, tell everybody you're Brit in Wonderland. You were just. Oh, yeah. You were just. Wonderland. That's right. So you were just on Unidentified Celebrity Review. Uh, I what? On Twitter under what's your handle? Uh, it's at inference. But the first E is a three. First E is a three. Awesome. Well, thanks for calling. What can I do for you? Okay, John, I wanted to talk about the meta materials and just speak on something that has bothered me for quite some time about the credit issue. Um, actually, I think I might have touched base on this with you before, but forgive me, I have like really bad ADHD. <laughs> no worries. Uh, <laughs> so, um, basically my thing is, is uh, how co-owns PTSA and I know that like I think in July 2019 PTSA acquired uh, these alleged special metals that were originally owned by Linda Howe and if I remember correctly and forgive me I might be wrong about this because it is just coming off the top of my head um, but I believe the Carnegie Science Department of Technical Magnetism and other educational facilities and entities had already studied these materials back in 2012, I believe. Right. So um, if I remember correctly, Hal wrote a letter stating that they basically weren't able to prove anything unique about the metal. So when I found out that TTSA was going to conduct research on it, I was really confused, right? Because um, I believe... Hmm. Okay, so when I asked other people about this, they told me it was because they didn't necessarily have the tools. Well, they being like Carnegie, for example, they didn't have the proper tools to research the metal. But, you know, I guess it had something to do with like the isotope ratio data that was mentioned earlier. But wouldn't Carnegie and other institutes already have like an isotope analysis? And another thing, too, is just like knowing that EarthTech is conducting the research on the materials that were already claimed by Hal himself to be nothing special. I just find that really odd and a massive conflict of interest. So right. with that being said, I just want to get your opinion on that and insight and maybe clear me up or maybe anyone else that may have like a misunderstanding about like what exactly is going on here. Well, what exactly is going on here is anybody's guess. Uh, yes, I did an interview with Linda Howe on this channel. Uh, for those who aren't oh, aware, oh, really? you, you can you can and she goes into great detail about it. Um, oh. I'll refer to your judgment on the Carnegie full title. Uh, but that that sounds right the way that you said it. And that yes, uh -huh. uh, Hal Putoff had said that there was uh, essentially and I'm paraphrasing, but essentially that there was nothing to those uh, pieces. So uh, it's kind of it's it's been a while since I interviewed Linda on it, and I'm I'm fairly confident that that came up. And I don't want to try and reach back in my brain and and give you the answer she did because I'll be honest and say I don't remember. Um, <laughs> but I but I will say just from a broader sense, there absolutely is something strange with that whole situation. And the, you know this ties into arts parts and the fact that these were kind of long. I don't want to say debunked, but it, it was kind of long rumored that there was just nothing there. And it wasn't just Dr. Hal Putoff's letter, uh, but it was other stuff as well. And so, you know, you, it's like these these stories are seemingly recycled over the years. We've seen it with MJ-12. And uh, even though the late Stanton Friedman, who was a, a dear personal friend of mine for over 20 years, uh, really did a lot of research on the original documents, there's a lot of stuff about MJ-12 that's that's just a downright hoax. It just is. Like, the, you just right. can't get away from it. And uh, those are the documents that I'm referring to. And yet, those have seemingly, in the last couple of years, resurfaced. Um, there's one that's tied to, to Dr. Hal Putoff, although I couldn't get him to go on the record about it, about a crash retrieval. And this is the National Intelligence Estimate document that, to me, is sc a screaming hoax. 
Uh, I also did a video di dissecting that that document as well. My entire point with that is going back to the root of your question, what is going on? Why is it that a lot of these stories just seemingly get recycled? And and why is it that a lot of the same names keep coming up? That's a different show. But it just seems like they just come up again. And regardless of, of let's say, Dr. Podoff saying, hey, there's nothing extraordinary about this, then all of a sudden he pays or his company pays, what is it, 20,000, 30,000, whatever it was. Oh, I think it was like, yeah, I think it was that much. Yeah, it was, I mean, it was tens of thousands. Uh, I think Vice News no, had reported that. Wasn't it like 750,000? No, I don't think it was that much. No? No, I think it was, if, huh. if, if memory serves, it was only like, well, not only, but I think it was either 20 or 35,000, but... Regardless, oh, yeah, I mean, no, no, no. Okay, there was, I think it was the, contract. no, it was 35. You're right. You're right. Yeah. So, so uh, what, what's up with that? You know, like if, right. if, if there was nothing extraordinary about it, then why allow the company that you co-founded to then acquire the piece? Like, you know, is it optics? Uh, is it something that you can, you know, put on, onto a, a slide and say, this is what we're doing, invest in our company. Um, you know, it, uh, I go back to that Showtime controversy that I got a lot of flack for. Well, not a lot, but mm -hmm. but those that hate me, uh, they, they come after me for <laughs> if I sneeze the wrong way, they'll come after me for it. Uh, but but the but about the you know the the money thing, why is it that a corporation like TTSA, their press releases, if you look at them, they're all dated when the um, when the lines were open to invest in the company. Once they close, the press releases stopped. Now, what does that show you? Well, they're out to market themselves to make money, you know, like, it's, yeah, so it's not a bad thing to say. Um, so why would they want to spend money like that on something that they didn't find extraordinary? I, I don't right. know. No, like, I, I have no idea. Up. Like, I don't understand it. Like, it just, it seems counterintuitive. It does. Uh, and, and I've never, I've never seen anybody adequately answer that or, or address it. I'm, I'm not really... Not really sure. I wish I had a better answer for you, but there's there's a lot of things like that that are just out of out of the ordinary, and yeah. and uh, again, I've I've primarily left TTSA as the corporation alone in the sense that I just don't feel like I, I want to critique them. Uh, I only focused on the parts that dealt with the government, but that kind of stuff. When I know per personally, the people that are signing these NDAs and signing you know, the, their work over to TTSA, what has happened, you know, since then? And I, and as a television producer who's profiled some of that material that is now in the hands of TTSA, there is a personal connection that I have to that. And that's why I kind of get passionate going, hey, what's going on? You know, you're taking right. this material, you've acquired this material, you've either purchased it, you've bought it, or you are borrowing it or whatever the story is. I mean, it seems like everybody has different contracts, but regardless, you've now acquired that. The army internally is saying, yeah, well, they just want to go out and get more stuff. Um, okay, <laughs> why? <laughs> like, if you got the key to the universe, I'll say it a 12th time, just go in there and unlock the door, you know, but they just don't do it. So I'm it's, not sure. It's just, it's just so confusing. And I sit here and I'm, I'm telling you, John, like this, Oh, it eats at me. Like, this is a question that I just, I cannot make sense of this whatsoever. And I'm deeply bothered by this. Yeah. And like, I don't know. Like, it's just like a little itch I can't scratch. Like, why? Why is this happening? Yeah. And, and to be honest with you, I don't know. I, I really don't. I, I mean, if, oh, T if TTSA has a plan, what I wanted to do with this story um, I'm, I'm not sure, Britt, how long you've been listening, uh, and you won't offend me if you didn't see it. But towards the earlier part of this, I showed what TTSA said, and I wanted to give them the opportunity to say, "Yeah, no, we couldn't because of COVID, uh, but but now we're ramping up, and and we're we're slated to be in there in August or or September, October, November, right. something." And for them to just fall back and go, you know, check our SEC filings, you go do what you want. Um, <laughs> it doesn't help. And, and it's no. not just uh, because I want to know, because John Greenwald, the meanie, wants to know. It's number one, as cheesy as it sounds, I'm a taxpayer. So we all in America are funding this. So we, there should be a level yeah. of transparency there. But then on Absolutely. the other end, there's a lot of people who invested in that company. And those investors yeah. have a right to know. Um, and COVID, albeit as a hardship, it can't be the fallback for everything. You know, I mean... They're, they're in production on their movies and, and films and stuff. So, 
it if if it's the army great say it if not then what's the hold up and i don't know right well you know i just wanted to get your opinions on that because i know that's a hard question and a lot of people just <laughs> aren't able to answer it yeah so. no a lot of people aren't so but i appreciate the question and thanks for the call hi thanks for uh, answering <laughs> anytime we'll call in anytime it's good to hear your voice all right you all take right. care john you too bye, chat. bye bye all right, let me go ahead and uh, hit this super chat. John, thank you so much. Sorry, it took me a couple minutes. List of people saying the public should not know the real truth about non-humans. Obama, Leslie Kane, Fravor, etc. Thoughts. We deserve truth regardless. Okay, so I understand the root of your question. I just don't know off the top of my head that they said we should not know the real truth about non-humans. Um, so I, I can't. I can't speak to that directly about Obama and Leslie Kane and, and Fravor saying uh, saying that. So so forgive me. I'm not real sure about the exact quotes. Uh, what I will say about this, and it's a it's a, a, a question that I have loved to answer and address and can bore you all to death for for years about it, is it's not should we know, which the answer is yes. It's are we able to handle it? as a society. And I would truly believe that the majority of the people that are watching this program absolutely could handle the real truth about non-humans should there be a truth about non-humans to reveal. Uh, I, I believe that. So outside of this show, outside of this audience, outside of that, the general populace that's walking around, are they ready? And the answer, in my opinion, only my opinion, is no. And when we look at the general population, and I've said it before and I'll say it again on this show, it doesn't matter how you think about masks or whether or not you should or shouldn't wear them. Remove yourself from being in the debate for a second and just look at the debate. The fact that that, that has turned in to this massive civil war between people in America and you look about masks in the classroom and how that has turned into a civil war. And you look at how the states have now, some are threatening, it was a Florida that's doing that, saying if you mandate this, then your pay is held or whatever. Um, that's a, a civil war. You're, you're, you're tearing this country apart. And again, I'm not trying to make it political. Remove yourself from the debate. Doesn't matter what side of the, of the debate you stand on. Just look at the debate, and that's my point. If we are fighting about that, do you think the general population could handle the fact that non-humans are here or visiting us or are out there? And my opinion is no. We are such a young civilization, intellectually, technologically. Uh, we just don't get it. We just don't. Like, there's a lot of stupidity out there. Uh, there's a lot of ignorance out there. And so I think that when it comes to such an amazing topic like this, and, and the reality behind it. Could we as a whole, as a whole handle it? The answer is no. So uh, in regards to the, the, the exact quotes, not to repeat myself, I'm curious if they've said that. So, you know, please feel, feel free to uh, send that to me because I'd love to, to see the exact quotes. Oliver, Oliver Dro, thank you uh, for this. A podcast I heard made me somber. An experience or a while ago, query ETs about why they interfere. Answer long ago in this planet, we got to nuclear and we destroyed ourselves never again. The problem that I have with, with the nuclear argument, just to uh, quickly address that, is that it's very common for humans to want a higher being, should one exist, to come and nurture us. You know, we growing up, we want that from our mom and dad or our grandma or grandpa or our soccer coach or whomever. And you want that because you're 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 infantile, right? You, you're you're not you're not as experienced. You're not as 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 um, you're not as powerful as those other you know beings, those other humans that you look up to. And I think that it's very natural for us to want that uh, because that's what we've grown up with. When it comes to the grander cosmic scale, and we talk about humanity now being that infant. I believe that there is a portion of our society that wants to think that this higher being is out there that will save us from the, the horrors of the world and, and, and the horrors of this planet, 
uh, would, would essentially be a nuclear holocaust, a nuclear war that would destroy us all. We want that. The reality, though, is would they care? And, and this is something that I love. There's another one of those. I'll bore you to death for hours. But I'll use this analogy for you. And I love the anthill analogy. And anybody who knows me knows I fall back on that a lot because I think it makes the most sense. The idea that they would come and, and save us from the nuclear holocaust is, is the same, I would say, situation where humanity would march out to the middle of the Sahara Desert and plant an American flag or the flag of Earth or whatever and tell an ant colony, we're here. We have lived thousands of miles in that direction. You didn't know that we were here, but we are here now. We want to help you against that termite colony over there because they could come hurt you or that other ant colony or they're going to build a road here so we're going to move you we don't do that we just don't because we just sadly don't care i do i love ants that's why i use the, <laughs> the ant analogy but regardless we just don't do that the intellectual gap arguably in my mind would be closer between a human and an ant hill, uh, an ant uh, that built that hill. It would be closer in that situation than it would be between humans and a civilization, let's say a million years head, a million year head start on us. And so would they come and save the ant hill? And I just don't see it. Because if we are here and they are there, they had that million year head start, the likelihood of us being the only ones around uh, is pretty nil. If that was the last anthill in the Sahara Desert, yeah, I believe humans would, would go save it, but it's not. So if the reality that there's a civilization out there that exists, they're going to come all this way to save the anthill from nuclear weapons, I just don't buy it. I just don't see it. Because there are millions and millions then, scientifically and mathematically, of civilizations out there to converse with. And if humanity on Earth is going to destroy itself, would they care? And it's that anthill again. I think the answer is no. Of course, that's just an opinion and for fun. But regardless, it uh, kind of goes into what you were saying. So Oliver, thank you. I hope that um, answered your question a little bit. Uh, but uh, but appreciate it nonetheless. And you came up back to back with another one. And I appreciate that. I'm the very opposite of what you just described. I hate authority of uh, or higher beings. I just hate it. I'd hate them to be interfering. But is this true? I might understand. Um, I think you're the ex not an exception to the rule, but I would say that that um, most people, you know, they, they want. Ah, do I want to say most? I'll correct myself. I'm not really sure what the majority would be. So I don't want to say you're an exception to the rule. I would, in my personal opinion, argue that the majority of human humanity wants that nurturing. They're going to come save us uh, because there's no other option. We can't destroy them. If they've got a million year, 100,000 year head start, and they can traverse the stars, we got no fighting chance. So I think that's the easy fallback for a lot of people. But uh, Oliver, it's a fun topic. And I not only appreciate your support, uh, but appreciate your thoughts nonetheless. Let me get one more super chat, and then I'll go back to the phones. I'm sorry uh, for those on hold. Did you, uh, Dolores, thank you for the support. Did you feel your views about Elizondo were accurately reflected in the Showtime series UFO? Did you like the show overall? I've been waiting for this question. I've been I've been wondering, is somebody going to ask this? Do I feel that my views about Elizondo are accurately reflected? I, I do in my specific what I said segments. I do not have any control over the writing of Showtime, the editing of Showtime, the overall message of Showtime, nothing. J.J. Abrams and his uh, uh, crew did all of that. What I stand by is what I said. And, and what I said, absolutely, I do believe that about uh, Mr. Elizondo, that he did operate like a ghost within a Pentagon, in the Pentagon. He operated in a office uh, that is very hard to find information on. Uh, I didn't make the accusation he was in it for the money. Uh, some people on Twitter tried to say that I said that. I did not. I was talking about that group as a whole, that some of them possibly had money as a motivating factor. I stand by that as well. I don't think anybody should scoff at that. That's why people get into to a corporate world like that. Um, if they didn't care, it'd be a 50C, uh, 503, um, 
five oh what is it five oh three C or whatever the nonprofit is. I'm drawing a blank. My back's killing me, so I apologize. Uh, but whatever the the nonprofit is, it would be that, and you would have a much different vision for it. But but instead, it was a public benefit corporation uh, that uh, was trying to raise fifty million dollars that had different angles of what they wanted to achieve. Uh, they have altered that vision, and rightfully so. It's their right to do that, but altered that vision to be financially more lucrative because they missed that 50 million mark um, across the board. So I spoke in general generality there, but with Mr. Elizondo, I stand by what I said. Everything is backed up by, uh, by official documentation and, and evidence or the lack thereof. So I don't, I, I don't have any issues with the way I was reflected on Showtime. And I'm always happy to, to answer, um, uh, specific questions on that. But again, I just want to punch the point. I don't have control over anyone else. I know that James Carrion was very pointed with what he said in the same segment that I appeared on about it being an op from the beginning. That's James. I, I, I was unaware James was even interviewed for the show. Uh, so what he says, I've, you'll have to check with him, but I'm happy to stand by what I did. Uh, did you like the show overall? I did. Um, I was, uh, Taking it from a viewpoint of being a, a television producer for many years, I've done many hours of documentaries for history and discovery and, and, and Nat Geo and stuff like that. And the reason why I bring that up is because there's there's one element to doing shows like that for networks that I think the general public doesn't always want to uh, understand or they don't understand, uh, which is you have to have a balance. You have to have a point and a counterpoint. And that's not always appealing to the UFO community. And to be honest with you, with me as a producer, when I was working uh, as one, it wasn't appealing to me either because you had to refute or give an alternate point of view uh, for a lot of the points that you were trying to make. I believe they had that balance. Uh, were they heavy on the abduction part, um, being the skeptical on the abduction part? I do believe that they were uh, heavy on that. Um, is that a complaint? No, because I believe that they still had that balance of people telling their stories, giving the information, and again, that journalistic back and forth. So I give them credit for that. I really do. And it, watching it took me back to getting network notes from the History Channel or from Discovery Channel or wherever, and you'll make a point in a show. And when you write a show like this, it's your baby. Like this is what you, you know, you put your heart and soul into a one hour documentary when you're doing them. And so for them to come back and go, ah, you got to cut this down. And then, you know, let's bring in uh, Dr. Seth Shostak and we'll go ahead and, you know, poo poo the idea or whatever it is. And you cringe and go, no, no, this is such a great segment. I want to, I want to do something else. But th those are the network notes because they want that balance. And so I saw that and I, and I kind of internally laughed a little bit, but I get it. And I, and I wish that the UFO community can understand that because if the skeptical point of view is wrong, then the pro point of view will stand on its own. And if the evidence is there to support narrative X, Y, and Z, then skeptical viewpoint A, B, and C will do nothing to it. And so when you offer that balance, you're offering the balance and you're letting the, the audience decide, but you have the information there. And if the information is strong enough to stand on its own, it absolutely will. Let me go to the phones. I'm so sorry I kept you on hold. Who's this? Hello. Hey. Hey, it's Erica. How are you? I'm good. Erica. Luke's. Well, I didn't recognize your your number. I won't I won't say the 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 locale. It's not your locale. Yeah, and so well, when you I, said, I was like, yeah, I know the yeah. voice, well, I know the name. Well, because I'm calling on Skype, you know. Uh, okay. Hi Erica Luke's. How are you? I'm pretty good. How are you? I'm doing awesome. I'm sorry to keep you on hold and I'm sorry to draw a blank there. Again, the the area code threw me off from where I know you are. So no, no, no. good, no, good okay. to hear your voice. And I, though. I just wanted to say that, first of all, I thought you did an excellent job on UFO. And I, I think that it was really interesting for me to see all of the backlash that you had for simply stating information that was actually truthful. And I feel, you know, the same about James Carrion, who was on my show last night. It was very funny to see the, the very small, quote-unquote, UFO community kind of lighting the, the 
pitch, you know, light, getting their pitchforks out, lighting the fires. And unfortunately, they when you're doing a good production, as you've mentioned, you you it's you have to present both sides to a story, and that's the thing that we never do in the UFO community. We go, we're so, you know, we're getting to, going down this rabbit hole of uh, just absolute nonsense that's actually very, uh, it, it's very damaging to individuals, and I think that we're not grounded and we're not capable of asking critical questions, and so I appreciated that you did that on, on the show. Well, I appreciate the kind words. Yeah, I, th- I think, uh, not to repeat what I said a few moments ago, but I, I, I think that what people don't realize is that if your evidence stands on its own, nothing you throw at it will damage it, you know, and, and albeit television is very powerful to craft a certain message or, you know, have that type of a objective. If they had a sinister one, they could achieve it really easy. Um, Yeah, absolutely. And I just lost you. I don't know if you can hear me. I, I can. Yeah. Um, not sure if you can still hear me, but, but yeah, I, 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 I didn't get that feeling, uh, with, with the Showtime documentary, they were they were posing important questions, and I think that the two big things that I saw the flack for anyway was the was the money comment, which I absolutely stand by. I don't think anybody should shy away from that, but also the aura that there was something underneath the onion layer of this truth and disclosure facade. Was there something else going on? And although I didn't say it that way, and I know James Carrion said more of the op part of it. I do believe we can't discount that, that there's some other layer that we don't know yet. And in fact, you can arguably say there absolutely is. I mean, look how many times answers are given saying I can't I can't say anything because of my NDA or my my security clearance or whatever. So there is another layer. What is that layer, though? And that and that's what I don't what I don't know. But I think too and, many people and want to I discount absolutely it. agree. And I, th- I think it is interesting. It, it, it's interesting to note, and hopefully you can hear me, I keep dropping out, we've got a storm coming in, but um, if you can hear me, it it is interesting to note that if you really truly have, you know, you're working on classified programs and you have security clearances, you don't go out in in the public and, uh, you know, talk about things like that. The, The last thing you do is draw attention to it. Yeah. And so I just have to wonder... Just have to wonder. We're going to be left in suspense, Erica. Did we? Lo- I think we we did lose you. So I get- oh, there <laughs> no, we go. Okay. We, we've got a big storm coming in. I know we've got a big storm coming in. But I was just saying, I, th- I you know, if if you're really working on classified programs and you're really doing the things that you say that you're doing, you don't go on TV shows and you don't write books about you know Skinwalker Ranch and do all of these things to draw attention to things. You're you're on the down low. Yeah. Because, you know, you've got your family and you've got people that you're protecting and you're protecting government secrets. So the, the, the whole thing of, I think, with, with put off Elizondo, uh, all of these people that have been promoting a narrative for a long, long time is I, after my research. Uh, I lost you again. People need to put information out or we know that they're, they're absolutely full, full of it. Well, I don't want to say full of it, what? but I think that the, for me anyway, there's still a lot of unanswered questions. And until we find those, those, those answers, we shouldn't stop asking. And there are too many noisy, there's not a ton, but there are too many very loud voices. And I, I agree until we find the answers. I, 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 and you're much, much kinder than I am. And I'm to the point <laughs> after the Skinwalker saga that I definitely, I will say they're full of it, and I'll call them out, uh, and I do, <laughs> because they've produced nothing but uh, creating a narrative that is confusing for people. They, they're making money off of things. They're not being forthright with their intentions. And to me, that's uh, very disturbing. And I hope at some point in time that that, that will be exposed. Yeah. So, I, I you know would, me, John. I don't. I don't back away from. No, 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 no. And 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 that's that's why I, that's why I like you is that you that you don't. Um, uh, the, the what I would say though that's that's very concerning is that I can support an entrepreneurial uh, venture. You know, if if they're going to profit, fine. But let's see results. What bothers me is the swallowing up 
of the information under the guise of transparency, openness, and we're going to change the world about UFOs. But look at uh, going back to the story that I was talking about earlier with, you know, the the pieces of UAP debris or crash records, whatever you want to f- refer to them as, that they've swallowed up all of that material and absolutely nothing has happened. And when you ask them as a taxpayer who is helping fund their agreement, uh, they just don't say anything. As an investor, their minute meeting meeting minutes that are public say absolutely nothing. That's the kind of stuff that I think should be ridiculed. The entrepreneurial profit venture, okay, we can maybe argue both ways on that. But it's the it's the control. And that to me, Mm -hmm. I think trumps all else is the control over the information, over the narrative. And although they've done a lot of great, they have done, and you may disagree with me, they've done a lot of great things for the conversation to be put into the public, right? Whether or not that's all rooted in 100% honesty. Yeah, we can probably find some some common ground there. But they have done that. And so I give them credit for that. But what worries me is, again, that control. And to see now the internal army documents and to see now that fear that I posed two years ago of you're taking this material, giving it to the to the government. And now the documentation shows that the Pentagon is involved in the message. Well, why would you do that? Like you're a private corporation that has this this want and desire to bring all this information out yet you just got in bed with the enemy number one that you guys are the ones that told us we're lying you know that that Mm -hmm. that mr elizondo spearheaded that part of the movement saying that we are not getting the full story so why would you take all that material that could be that that key to unlocking this entire mystery and give it right back to them i don't i don't get that so financial stuff aside uh, it's it's that control, and it, it just bugs me to no end. No, and I, I absolutely agree, and those are great points. I, I definitely just have to say to to people, it, it's we've got to quit. I, I feel looking for disclosure. We're not going to get it from the powers that be, the people that are screaming the loudest about disclosure, yeah. because they're making money, they're holding conferences. Um, in fact, there was a, a great conference this weekend that Elizondo and Howe and, and uh, Whitley Strieber and those people were at. Uh, and so it's, it's uh, I really feel that we deserve better than this. I think that there, there's a lot of money, power, politics, I hate to say it, but there's some things that we need to look at because we, at the end of the day, people that are here that follow my show that follow your show are here because we want the truth and and we deserve it yeah uh, and uh no disagreement with me there uh or from me there uh you're absolutely right i hope we get it uh and your phone call reminds me that we got to bring you back onto uh, this channel for a full conversation because i always love talking to you well, and I do too, and I need to get you on my show, but I just, I would love to come on because I've learned so much more about Skinwalker Ranch and about some of the other things since I acquired the Andropha files. So I would love that opportunity. Yeah, uh, very cool stuff. And uh, obviously you have uh, a radio show. Real quick before I let you go, and then I'm going to have to close my show here. But how do people uh, see your show? So my show is UFO Classified. Now I'm, I'm streaming on YouTube, or you can find it on uh, Spreaker or iTunes and things like that. And so you can go to ufoclassified.com or ericalukes.com to find out more. But I try to bring on people like you and James Carrion and people who are dedicated to trying to find the truth and weeding through all of the nonsense. Awesome. Uh, well, I always uh, in, enjoy being on your show. So thanks for that uh, and inviting me in the past. And we'll have to do it again on on both sides of this. But it's good to hear your voice again. Thanks for the call. Thank you. Yeah, have a good night. Thanks, you too. All right, I am going to have to wind, uh, wind this up uh, here in a couple minutes. Let me go ahead and I took the number off the screen. I don't know how many people uh, might be on hold, but let me go ahead and get to the last couple super chats here. John Music again, thank you for your uh, continued support. Sheehan said recently with Bob McGuire that he's going to push extremely legally hard for full disclosure to the public about non-human reality thoughts. 
I don't believe a lawyer can do it. I love Danny Sheehan in the sense that I've known him for years, uh, lectured at the same, uh, you know, the same uh, conferences as, as him uh, and, and sat on panels with him and have a lot of respect for him. Uh, as with anybody in this field, we always don't agree, but I uh, like him nonetheless. Pushing hard for the disclosure, though, I just don't see it. Um, I don't think it's going to come that way. I personally, on disclosure, don't think it's going to come at all uh, in regards to an official line. Somebody like uh, who just called Erica Lukes saying the same thing. It's not going to come from the powers that be. And I agree. You look at the history from the 1940s on, uh, it's just not going to be there. So that said, thank you, John. Let me go ahead and let me pull on this caller. I was going to cut the show, but this caller might be kind of interesting. Who's this? <laughs> Hello, this is John. I'm, uh, I'm from a place you've probably never heard of called Northridge. Northridge, California. John, I grew up there. You're kidding. I did. And uh, your voice sounds awfully familiar. Well, I imitate a lot of people sometimes. You do. Well, you probably imitate me a lot, just a much older version. Uh, <laughs> let me introduce everybody to my father, who has probably been watching and wants to, I don't know, turn it into a political talk show or something and get me in trouble. Well, I, actually, I was going to, but I, had, I, I got a different, I got something different to ask. Oh, good. <laughs> well, wait, wait, wait. So before you go there. So anybody who's followed the Black Vault for a long time, this is Greeny 2 that has been on the message boards for a long time. Now, with the social media empires taking over, uh, message forums aren't as popular anymore. Uh, but my dad has been a longtime user under the name of Greeny 2, has gotten into trouble more times than I can count. I think I've banned you 100,000 times, but you keep coming back. But and that's, I'm not done yet. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, but okay, so let's get to the uh, the question. I'm a little nervous. Uh, okay, well, first of all, I wanted to say your mother and I were just glued to the uh, the Showtime UFO show. We thought it was just absolutely fantastic, and uh, we're going to probably watch it again five or six times. Oh, but, uh, well, I appreciate it. My biggest fans, <laughs> you too. <laughs> no, actually, you were, you were saying a little while ago about... Uh, you know, we have such a fascination with, in our country, maybe even the world, with, have, you know, have we had visitors from far, far away places? And, uh, you know, the fascination of, is there life somewhere, is there not, and how would we react to it? But then on, on our side here, we don't have that kind of fascination about watching our own space program, and, and it's... Uh, uh, you know, we're doing amazing things, and we're going to amazing places. I mean, nowhere remotely close as, uh, you know, anybody would be coming to uh, to visit us. But uh, I don't know, I wonder what is your opinion on, you know, like the recent uh, space flights where, you know, they've been taking civilians up, and we have plans to go back to the moon, and... You know, we're, you know, the goal is to send people to Mars in some future. And uh, I'm wondering why, why do we not have the same fascination for, for our own space program when we're so fascinated with uh, wondering who can reach us? Yeah. Yeah, no, you're, you're absolutely right. And to get, there's a, a bunch of chat things coming in right now. So to address some of the questions, this is my dad. So yes, <laughs> I'm not kidding. Uh, this is John Greenwald senior. Um, I grew up in a house and, and dad, this is for the audience uh, who doesn't know this, but I grew up in a house where my dad uh, worked on the space shuttle. And so when you see the space shuttle uh, take off or when we saw it take off, uh, the big engines on the bottom, the RS 68s or the SSMEs, that was my dad's baby. So he was, you know, you were, you were and are a hero to that entire program. And I'm not saying that because you're my dad, but, well, um, thank you. but it instilled a love for me into the space program and growing up, you know, the privatization of it. And I think actually you and I may even differ on this. But I hated to see that. I hated to see the commercialization 
of the space race and essentially the Elon Musk and the the Jeff Bezos and and every and Richard Branson going up. And I didn't I didn't like that. I, I because I felt the passion was lost. Now to Elon Musk's credit, I will give him the passion. I saw something uh, that he did in an interview and he got emotional. He got teary eyed and you know, anybody can do that as an actor, but, but he wasn't acting. I mean, you could tell the passion yeah. behind what he did. So I can see part of the passion, but I think that that plays a role in that pe- the general public has lost interest. And, and I really hate to say this, but it was fun to see so many big numbers, watch Branson go up and, and um, uh, Bezos go up. But I, and I cringe saying this, but how it's like watching a NASCAR race that they're looking for the crash. You know, yeah. and, and I hate to say it that way, but but I, I feel that that's why some people tuned in. And, and I'd argue maybe even a lot that were looking for the, the, the crash on turn number three. And that's mm-hmm. what it was. But the passion for where we're going in space is gone. And and I and I for the majority of the people and I hate that I, I cringe. You know, I mean, you look at what we've done on Mars in the last year and flying a helicopter and doing all this stuff. Um, that to me is so overlooked and, and so, um, lost, I, I think. And yeah, it's s- remarkable. And you would think that people would be marveling over it, especially when you hear that that little helicopter had a swatch taken off of the Wright brothers airplane yeah. and was, and was on that little helicopter. That's, I mean, that's just astounding yeah. to me. Yeah, and and those are the types of stories I think that that the general public is missing out on, and I feel that we're as a whole losing that. And the question mark is, you know, people love the UFO stuff, like our aliens here and so on and so forth, because it's pop culturey and and it gets some some good headlines. Um, but I think that they're 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 missing the bigger picture, you know, that we should really sit down and figure out w- what the answer to these questions are. And I think a lot of people aren't. Um, I interviewed Avi Loeb uh, from Harvard University on this channel not too long ago. And you can see that he really wants those answers. What boggles my mind is why don't more people want those answers, not only in the scientific community, but the general public. And, and I don't I wish I knew the answer to that, but I just I don't have it. Um, but I but I will say that that uh, that was one thing growing up that that was so amazing that I've never lost, which was you know, the, the, the love for the, the, the space race and space technology and the advancements for that, because there was such passion with what you guys did. And, and another quick story uh, for the audience is that dad would have, <laughs> dad would, can I admit this? Uh, dad would have these take your son to work days or take your kid to work days. And you had to be like a, under a certain age, you know, to go. <laughs> And uh, can I say it? Like, how yeah, like, sure. how many years after did I blow past the age that I was supposed to be? And I think you kept saying, "Oh yeah, he's seven. And I was like eighteen <laughs> going in there. And yeah, uh, I think that last one we got you right in. But um, I, you remember, I, I there was a c- control center, and they were they were communicating. I forget what it was. It wasn't only with the shuttle, but I started asking about something that I guess encroached on the a classified aspect of the communication technology. Do you remember that? Yeah. Yeah. And, yes. and, <laughs> uh, I don't know if you got oh. in trouble for that, but yeah, I remember. No, you, you know where I think you asked, you also asked that when we went down and we took that, uh, uh, didn't we take a tour on a, on a Navy ship and you started asking the, the guy, classified questions or something and yeah that too that was that was in san diego i think we did that that ship no the one was at your work because i was afraid i got you in trouble it was in one of the conference centers and they were able to tap into the shuttle they were able to communicate with houston or uh florida yeah they they could uh well every launch was monitored in a control room you know actually in the main building there and and that actually is now in the museum. Remember when we went to see the Enterprise, uh, and uh, not the Enterprise, the uh, Endeavor. Yeah. And they had that whole control panel that came out of the main building that uh, they would monitor every launch from. And uh, well, 
Have you got another second for I can tell them a little story yeah, about of course, that open, of course. the open house when you came? Yeah, this is a pleasant surprise. Well, when uh, when I got John to come in for for uh, bring your kid to work day, I had a special um, a special part that I asked my boss to hold for a day till John was there, and it was the uh, it was the uh, replica manifold of the X33 main injector manifold, and I had it all set up. And John and I welded it together, and it was then x-rayed and approved for the um, procedure to weld the main manifolds on the X-33 engines, which were called the uh, linear arrow spike. So John has actually welded on things that, that were used for space, and I believe that little uh, manifold that we... Uh, that we welded John was assembled into a, a smaller size engine and it was mounted to the back of an X, the XR7, SR71 and, uh, and actually, actually flown to do tests for the X33. But wow. That, unfortunately, the X33 program was canceled and uh, uh, it, was, it had failures in part of the fuselage and the, the, the fuel tanks leaking. So that was, uh, was a great program, but it never made it, uh, made it, you know, off the ground. It was canceled. But John got to weld the actual manifolds that uh, approved the welding for those engines. Yeah, what, uh, what was cool, just to point out, is that you used robots. You did a lot of manual welding. But you, uh, even years and years and years ago, like on, I think you, you said that they were like 286 processors, but would use r these gigantic robots and you would program in the welds and you would do the welds that way, which was fascinating to me because I'm a computer geek and not to embarrass you, you get lost in like Microsoft Word. And then mm -hmm. I went to work with you and then you're like programming these, you know, robots and welding all this stuff that's flying humans to space. I'm like, who's this guy? Like, I don't know who this guy is, which was, uh, which was always fun. I thought you were going to tell the story about the, the part that was on that big robot arm that you moved and you found out later it wasn't strapped down. Should I say that? Which one not? was that now? Though? Should I not say that? When you move that big arm and you had that gigantic piece on it, I may, okay. I may, may be yeah. getting you in trouble and you moved it. The, it was like a big crane and it, uh, I don't know if you're watching me right now, but it kind of would go up to the side and you, you would pretty much be able to move it to do different welds and different angles. Oh, that's the, yeah, the big robot. That was, yeah. That's... Do you remember that, that day yeah. when, when it, yeah. <laughs> I shouldn't have admitted that on the air. Sorry. <laughs> well, but, there was always some mistakes made here and there, you know? Yeah. Well, nothing happened on that day, but no, uh, no. Thanks. Uh, thankfully uh, you were perfect with every weld that you did, <laughs> but well, I wish, but, uh, yeah, I was very lucky to work where I worked, and uh, it was always fun when we had uh, open houses for the uh, for the public because people got to see things that you know if you've never gone through a plant like that. It's it's amazing. I mean, thirty years I was there, and parts of it still amaze me. Yeah, uh, yeah. and you were uh, just to kind of close it off. Uh, you were awarded the Snoopy Award. Uh, can mm -hmm. you tell everybody what that is? Well, the Silver Snoopy Award is awarded not by my company or Rocketdyne. It's awarded by NASA. And when I was awarded mine with the metal fitter I worked with, we were given our award by uh, the commander of the return to flight space shuttle flight. And um, I went to see that... Uh, that returned to flight landing with John and his sister, and it was a uh, a school uh, field trip. So that was really that was really fun for me. That the the uh, commander that gave me my award was the one that piloted the first shuttle flight after the Challenger, and we got to go see it at the at the dry lake, and that was just. Um, 
Never thought I'd seen so many motorhomes and people in my life. There was something like 500,000 people uh, that were out there. We camped out for the night, and it just was, uh, it was really something. It really was a experience. And a thing came in, and the sonic booms went off, and, uh, and we just had a great time with that. Yeah. I miss I miss the shuttle, you know. I miss yeah. those the the not only seeing it in the the very few times that I did, but I'm just talking about on television seeing it and miss that whole program and the passion behind it. I, I hope they I hope they do something like I don't think there's plans for it, but I hope they do something like that again. You know that that gets people passionate about going to the stars. That it's not for funny, not for money, or not f- for a celebrity to pay millions of dollars to go, but Mm -hmm. to have them have a reason to go, you know, and there's so much more to explore and not to put a damper on it, but humanity has got to get off this blue rock eventually. So, you know, we're (laughs) going to have to figure it out. So, uh, you know, eventually this planet's going to go kaput. So, um, yeah, I hope they go back to it, but, uh, I will say this, uh, as, as a closing thought, uh, as I see this, the chat stream through, uh, you're a hit and people want you to come back and tell us more story and, and you tell us more stories. So okay. will you That's do deal. that deal? All right. Well, that, that didn't take much convincing. I thought you were going to ask for a barbecue or filet mignon <laughs> or something like that. Well, we could do that. All right. Well then that's, that's a deal. We'll, we'll just live stream it from the patio. So that'll be perfect. Um, uh, but thank you. know, th- I'm not trying to cut you off. I'm going to have to, uh, cut the stream here. Uh, but I really, um, I'm glad you called and I know that everybody in the chat and everything, uh, is happy as well. Yeah, me too. So All first right. time caller, first, oh. first time, not the last time either. So t- tell mom, tell mom, hi, love you guys. Okay. Well, she's listening in the other room. Oh, good. And she's probably yeah. going to hit you about something. See. Okay. <laughs> All right. Love you guys. We'll talk okay, to you soon. Love you. All right. That's my dad. I, that was not planned. So, um, you know, that's, uh, that's, that's, that's the man, the, the myth, the legend. So, um, yeah, I, 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 uh, I'm glad he called in and that's a good, a good way to end. And I'm sorry for those that were on hold. I'm seeing, uh, that there are more people coming in. I apologize. Uh, we've been on for about two and a half hours. Uh, and so a little bit longer than I expected, but I just wanted to say thank you to all of you for tuning in. Thanks to my dad, obviously, for calling all of the Super Chats. I believe uh, through the last 10, 15 minutes, I missed some. I'm going to go back. I'm going to find a way to contact you guys and thank you and answer any questions you have. I apologize uh, for for missing any of those. Uh, But thank you all uh, for your support of this channel. Make sure that you click on the like below, the thumbs up, and make sure you're subscribed to the channel. The biggest help you can do is spread the word uh, for this channel. Let them know about these live streams. I've got different types of videos. Some are short form, some are long form, all sorts of different content. This summer has been a little bit challenging just because my uh, seven-year-old son has been off for summer vacation. So recording has been a little bit challenging schedule-wise. And obviously my wife is in a COVID unit at a hospital that... uh, We all have increasing numbers right now in Los Angeles. So schedule's been a little bit crazy, uh, but she's on her way home. She was in the COVID unit all day today. So I'm going to go get her some dinner uh, and have a a good night. But thank you again for all of your support. And lastly, if you feel so inclined, I do have a Patreon 100% of Super Chats or Patreons. They all go into this channel or the Black Vault. I don't use the money for anything else. It all 100% goes to supporting all of this. So if you choose to do that, you will find that link as well on the blackvault.com. Just look on the right-hand side. You'll find all the ways to support the site. And of course, download more than 3 million pages of government documents on any government secret you can imagine. So with that being said, thank you all again. This is John Greenwald Jr. signing off, and we'll see you next time.